Good morning and a very warm welcome to all of you uh, for to today's discussions on the perils and potential uh, in global trade relations, in particular looking at um, the EU-China uh, trade relations, but also, of course, at uh, the role of the US in the triangle of those three largest uh, economies. In particular, I would like to welcome the China Center for International Economic Exchanges um, that uh, um, has started the initiative and um, wanted to come to Brussels and speak about uh, these perils and potential uh, for trade. And let me in particular uh, welcome um, President Zhou Xiaoxuan, uh, President of the China Society for Finance and Banking Advisor and former uh, Governor of the People's Bank of, of China, as well as uh, Wei, uh, uh, Vice Chairman Wei Jiangguo um, from the CCIEE. We're very much welcome. Thank you for coming and for discussing. And uh, of course, let me discuss, uh, let me welcome uh, Hermann von Rompuy, the former president of the European Council and the former prime minister of, of Belgium. Thank you very much for coming. In today's discussion, um, we uh, want to talk about trade, and it is clear that trade um, is not a zero-sum game. Each side can benefit from economic exchanges, and without trade, our economies would be significantly poorer. But trade also comes with frictions and with tensions. It has domestic distributional consequences. And the question is how well our societies are equipped to deal with this and how well are our welfare systems equipped to cope with this challenge. Growth and benefits to achieve those requires clear rules that apply equally to all. A level playing field is absolutely fundamental, and therefore the discussion is timely. A lot of worry here in Europe concerns, of course, um, the United States um, and uh, President Trump's uh, announcements on trade, and then um, uh, the moving back on trade on, on, his, on some of his announcements. But let's be clear, there's also a lot of worry, an equal amount of worry, relative to um, Chinese economic model and the way it interacts with the Western European uh, model. Let me uh, recall that uh, as recently as in May, um, the three uh, trade representatives from uh, the US, from uh, the EU, and from Japan uh, had a joint statement which worried about um, the uh, 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 pressure to do technology transfer uh, when investing uh, in countries, in major countries uh, in this world. And I think it was quite clear that um, the country in mind of those three um, representatives was, um, uh, of course, um, China. So I, I think this is, this is really an important debate because we do not want uh, this to become a zero-sum debate. Um, we want trade uh, in principle, yes, but we also want the clear rules that apply to everybody and we want them to be, be fair. Um, and I think it's, it's very timely to discuss these issues and, uh, and I think uh, we have absolutely a star panel um, following um, the initial statements. We will have a, a panel debate with um, four <coughs> presentations followed by an open discussion with questions and answers uh, to which everybody can participate um, and then some, uh, some ending statements. So, so without much, much further ado, I think we will have a very interesting day to discuss um, all of these important issues. Let me give um, the uh, word to uh, Vice Chairman Wei Jiangguo uh, for a few welcoming remarks as well and then um, uh, we move to our opening remarks by Hamad von Rompuy and President Zhou Xiang Shuao. Please. Far away, Mr. Uh, right now, I'm a vice chairman of CCIE. Uh, this is a great honor for me to participate as a hosting. Dang Chen, woman. 
at present, China and EU. I should say China and EU are two very important economies in the world. Today, we are hosting this discussion here. The purpose of this discussion is to talk about, at the current stage of uncertainty, China and the EU are working together to look for a closely cooperated win-win relationship. Today, we have invited high-level think tanks from both sides to have this very important discussion. We hope this forum can achieve a lot of results through candid and free exchange. If we have any questions, please ask. We are looking to solve the difficult challenges or the questions in focus and then come up with resolutions and ways to deal with these challenges. These are the core objectives of this forum. So we have invited press representatives as well as representatives from the industry, from enterprises, and people from both sides are paying great attention to this forum too. Our sincerely wish with the exchange between these think tanks from China and the EU, and we could erase some misunderstandings, and we can further exchange views on different understandings of the same thing. So the forum is used to clarify. The forum is used to provide a understanding and resolutions for our next steps. So this forum could be a guiding light for our future work. I should say this forum is the highest level forum with experts from both sides, from the Chinese side and the EU side. And both sides are paying great attention to this discussion among and between think tanks between China and EU. I sincerely wish we could have a complete success with our co-efforts. Yes. Yes. So, so um, I think our next speaker uh, is uh, is um, uh, Hermann von Rompuy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before uh, saying a few words about the, and more than a few words about the perils and potential of the China, U.S., and EU trade relations, I will draw a bigger picture, uh, if you allow me to do so. Ladies and gentlemen, some observers of the current global situation are of the view that we live in a dangerous world. Others speak about the case of global optimism, words of Larry Summers, the former uh, Secretary of the Treasury in the United States. What is the state of the world and why being hopeful? We have less extreme poverty than ever also due to the, uh, what happened uh, inside China. We have more prosperity, more functioning democracies, fewer local conflicts, and almost no global threat of war, such as we had during the Cold War. Much more interdependency, including in many domains, going beyond just the economy, such as tourism, culture, entertainment, communication, etc. Colonialism and imperialism have disappeared also in Europe after the fall of the Berlin Wall. All this pleads in favor of optimism, of hope. The anxiety comes from the prospects. We are facing a demographic and migratory explosion, especially in Africa. Climate change is the biggest challenge for mankind. The Paris Agreement even implemented as convened will by no means be sufficient to bring global warming under the needed 2% uh, Celsius. Our multicultural framework and the international order is under pressure due to growing nationalism and protectionism. A financial crisis is bound to happen due to the very high level of both private and public debt worldwide 
which is now even higher than 10 years ago. So what can we do in order to strengthen the forces of optimism and the forces of hope? First, interdependency has to be an objective, not only for economic growth, but in the first place for peace. Trade, not war, a no trade war. This has been the recipe of the EU. It has to continue to be the aim in the future. We shouldn't pay mere lip service to it because it is so crucial. The idea is not only a European one, but entails the worldwide free movement of goods, services, capital, and people. But these freedoms have to be fair and rules-based so that the stability of economies and societies are not jeopardized. Second reason of uh, hope. Interdependency is the royal way to prosperity. The experience of the emerging economies such as China and of the European Union has given evidence to this statement. But we have to look at the distribution of the economic growth. Inequality leads to polarization and confrontation. It is the root cause of populism and extremism. It leads to massive migration, I mean huge inequalities. And migration, the biggest political issue today in Europe. Inequality undermines the popular support for interdependency and globalization. It threatens social cohesion. The aim should be prosperity for all. And this is ultimately a task for the nation states. They have the tools to correct the negative aspects of globalization. It is their responsibility. Globalization of economies, capital, human flows, the internet needs a global response, a form of global governance. The answer to the world wars was world peace, an objective enshrined in the Charter of the United Nations. It has not only been a success story, but we have avoided the worst. And this is already an achievement in itself. There will, be ne there will never be a world government, but we can agree on world governance embodied in separate organizations such as the United Nations Framework for Climate Change Convention, the G20, the World Trade Organization, the International uh, Court of Justice, the United Nations, of course, the International Monetary Fund. Each of them has its own history and decision-making processes. Some of them have to be reformed against vested interests. For some of them, we have to fight for their survival. We all are in the same boat. And real leadership is the recognition of the 21st century reality. It needs no courage to be a nationalist. The opposite rather is true. We love our own country, and leaders have to defend the legitimate interests of their own people. But this is no longer enough to protect the long-term interests of their people. A people without vision perishes. And this is also true for mankind. We have to add a new global dimension to our vision. We shouldn't give up our national identities, but complement them. And that's what we try to do in the European Union. It is not always easy, but the support for EU membership is still very high, even bigger now than 10 years ago. Despite the challenges, a large majority of the Europeans know that in today's world, there is no alternative to cooperation and integration. The balance of power shifted dramatically after the end of the Cold War and following the economic rise of China and other emerging nations. It's the economy, stupid, famous word of Bill Clinton, is true on a global scale. We aren't living anymore in a bipolar world, not in a unipolar world, not even in a multipolar world, but in an apolar world. Nobody rules the world. Nobody wants to rule the world due to a lack of financial and economic means or to a lack of societal support internally or due to a main focus on national priorities. 
The most worrying tendency is nationalism inspired by the so-called glorious past. Nostalgia never is a good advisor. The past never comes back, at least not in the way it once was. Ladies and gentlemen, a peaceful rivalry between competing systems is not dangerous in itself. History will show which one is the most sustainable and the most humane. Too soon to judge all this. I'm paraphrasing former Prime Minister Chu and Lai when his assessment was asked about the impact of the French Revolution two centuries earlier. He said, too soon to judge. This absence of polars and the global challenges to an interdependent, interdependent world make cooperation more necessary and more possible. It requires a sense of compromise. There is no life without compromise. Even in every political system, the Union is more than others a living example of a continuous conversation between 28 member states. Ending disputes, also trade disputes, ending conflicts, wars can only be achieved via negotiation and diplomacy. Multilateral organizations, for instance, the World Trade Organization, have structures and procedures to settle differences. Conflicts of interest are not unusual, but we should solve them via the usual channels. Otherwise, stability is lost. Dialogue in multilateral institutions is key for creating and maintaining a minimum of trust among global actors. Unfortunately, today, we miss that level of trust. Conversation leads to moderation, and this is precisely what we need. Before dealing with the EU-China relationship, just a few words about the state of the European Union, and I'm devoting this paragraph especially to our Chinese friends. The EU economy is in good shape growing since three years at a pace of 2 at 3% a year, which is good for a mature economy, because we are a mature economy. We are not an emerging economy. Fiscal deficits, on average, are very low, and the current account of the balance of payments is in surplus. We have created in the Union almost 12 million jobs since 2014. Massive migration flows have been stopped since 2016. We will have decreased greenhouse gas emissions in 2020 with 23% since 1990, better than the objective of minus 20%. Brexit is, of course, a setback, but it is clear now that Britain will remain close to the customs union and the single market. The union speaks with one voice about trade, climate change, monetary policy, Brexit, Ukraine, and key issues of foreign policy, such as the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and Iran. Our global partners are increasingly aware of it. Even the US, when it had to deal with the president of the European Commission on Trade. Of course, Europe has its own internal problems, but the will to find solutions is still alive and is often underestimated by others. The China-EU partnership is a mature one, with convergences and divergences, on values as well as on interests. But we try each time to find solutions via dialogue, even if it takes time. We share a key common value, peace. And that's why we work together on the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and Iran. The EU and China share an unwavering commitment to combat climate change, the biggest moral issue for mankind. We are not engaged in a rear guard action against or of about the man-made origins of climate change, and we don't see a contradiction between economy and ecology. On the contrary, renewable energies are a sector of the future, even already of today. But the EU and China have different political systems based on different values. 
that was about values, about interest. We have a common interest in a rules-based trade system, especially those rules agreed in the World Trade Organization. But we have differences on our mutual trade and investment relations. The European Union became China's biggest trading partner and main investor. Our trade volume is around 1.5 billion a day without a free trade agreement. Without a free trade agreement. China's success is in Europe's interest. And meanwhile, China has rapidly become a major investor in the EU. But EU investments in China last year was roughly 3% of what we invested into the United States. And other figures from both the EU and China show that EU investment into China is decreasing. The problem is known for some time. It's about time to solve it. Reciprocity is a key word. And there are encouraging signals noticed especially since the last EU-China summit in July. And let me quote from the communique. The two sides view the ongoing investment agreement negotiations as a top priority and a key project towards establishing and maintaining an open, predictable, fair and transparent business environment for these respective investors. Another quotation, the two sides will continue to force synergies between China's Belt and Road Initiative and the EU's initiatives, including the EU investment plan and extended trans-European transport networks. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, an investment agreement between the EU and China would be a strong signal in the midst of rising protectionism. The outcome of the meeting between Germany and China in July is also encouraging, especially about joint ventures. All this reflects how big the potential for further growth still is if the conditions are right. The European Union wants a positive agenda with China about what we can do together to our bilateral relationship. China and the EU would then stand stronger in our endeavor for keeping the world economy as open as possible. The conclusions of the China-EU summit are promising, but should be implemented. China and the EU have to show that there are alternatives to trade wars for settling differences. Europe and China have two other challenges in common. The absence of sufficient own energy resources and a steep demographic decline. The first problem has to be tackled in conjunction with climate change and the digital revolution. Renewables and the electric cars are part of the answer. The second pose problems of labor shortage and needs to put all the emphasis on productivity and creativity in an aging society more inclined to risk avoiding. The EU and China nowadays have a great responsibility to overcome global tensions and confrontations. We both are engaged in the work for a world of stability and openness. It is needed more than ever. We have together a special responsibility. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much, uh, President von Rompuy, and let me now uh, give the floor to uh, the Vice Chairman um, of the 12th National Committee of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, um, Vice Chairman uh, Zhou, the floor is yours. Uh, uh. Thank you very much, President Vai Rompuy. Thank you very much, Mr. Gochen Wolf. Today, China Center for International Economic Exchanges and Brugal Institute are hosting this seminar. We are thanking you for your attendance. We know Brugal Institute is a high-level and high-quality think tank. Jean-Claude Friedherr is my old friend and my old colleague. I have often received some excerpts into my email boxes. 
During meetings and publications, I read your excellent articles. On the way here to Brussels, I read an article about the comparison between Italian debt and the Belgian debt, and the ways and the resolutions two countries have taken to solve these problems. The China Center for International Economic Exchanges is a strong performer of research. It also has the ability of networking. As one of the advisors of CCIEE, I sincerely wish a success of this seminar, and you can reinforce your understanding and you can make friends. So in the future, you can carry out a better communication among each other. Like what Mr. Van Rompuy has said, China-EU trade relationship is very close. The development is very fast. Using his word, I should say we are on the same boat. Next, I believe all the experts will mention the specifics of the relationship between China and EU. The topic of this seminar is on trade relationship, including the relationship between China and the U.S. Mr. Van Rompuy commented on the conflicts of trade and economy, and thank you very much for your excellent deliberation and comment on that. We believe we see more and more conflicts. Even now, we are having war, trade war, and a tariff war. The protectionism is on the rise. Multilevelism, multilateralism is being conflicted, and there is a huge uncertainty. With this as a huge backdrop, Chinese government is very willing to cooperate with Republic of Korea, Japan, ASEAN, as well as EU to work together to revert this trend. We sincerely hope that the China-EU summit can achieve a lot of achievements. Mr. President, just now you mentioned China and the EU having a set of common understandings. That is, we support the multilateral trade system for an open world to improve the liberation and the facilitation of a trade. We do have a lot of common understandings and a lot of things in common. You particularly mentioned our resolutions and measures to fight against climate change. So from all aspects, we should say China and EU have a very good basis for cooperation. Both sides support WTO rules as well as other rules from other multinational intergovernmental organizations. At the same time, China and EU propose further reforms with the basis of these rules. All these main points, all these main ideas, our Chinese President Xi Jinping commented on them in last year's Davos Forum. At the present, we are talking about trade, we are talking about economy. One of the focus is the China-U.S. trade war, of course. Based on the game theory, the trade negotiation process is a process of game. It's a process of gaming. The gaming between these two sides, China and U.S., is that U.S. goes first, China follows. When you when one plays the cards, there are some rules or measures like uh, cheating, like uh, threatening. All these are specific ways of a game rule. So in the process of a game playing, these are not surprising at all. The objective of a gaming, for one thing, it might be out of uh, domestic political considerations. Possibly it is not the real cause from domestic economy. What we could see is that it's the beginning of the chess game. It is too far away to say a conclusion. We sincerely hope 
these type of gaming, these type of game, can gradually come to calmness, balance, and people should think about the big picture. People should think about the interests and common benefits of the whole world. Secondly, these gamings, these games are not just bilateral. It involves all different parties. We sincerely hope that we could carry out communications and adjustment with EU countries in order to achieve the objective we all look forward to seeing. The China-EU trade war, um, we do not know what the future might be. But my personal understanding is that we could give out two assumptions. One assumption is that in the heart of the United States of America, um, she is going to establish a trade, free trade system that is beneficial to herself. Because the American tradition is that economy developed in free economy. China and EU, as well as other countries from Asia, as well as the communication and understanding between the EU side and the European and the Asian countries, will try our best to avoid a too hard um, impact or loss or damage. We have a second assumption that is the American side after its internal consultation will choose to leave the free trade system and choose trade protectionism. They will stay away from multilateralism. She is going to rely on bilateral negotiation and agreement. The second assumption is that U.S. is choosing to distort the market. Therefore, the resource allocation efficiency is low. Possibly, America is using tariff to make up the, sub the fiscal deficit recently experienced. If we have the second assumption, I would say sorry to entrepreneurs and enterprises as well as the industry of the United States of America. If the second assumption comes true, we need China and EU as well as other Asian countries, of course, including other countries from the rest of the world, to work hard to facilitate and liberate the trade in order to complete or com complement the loss caused by the unilateralism by the United States of America. My personal belief is that the first assumption is to happen. I also believe the future trend will be the trend of the first assumption. But no matter what assumption goes ahead, uh, the communication exchange between China and the EU is necessary and beneficial. President Varon Pei mentioned just now, um, between China and EU, we need to facilitate and uh, quicken or speed up our bilateral investment agreement negotiation. China, a Chinese economy is a transitional economy from a planned economy to market economy. China choose a gradual yet stable and resolute transition. China is a huge country. In the process of transition, we might encounter difficulties or ups and downs. In the process of the transition and foreign investment access, intellectual property, protection, financial resource allocation, as well as all aspects of economy. There are some rooms for improvement for governments. Some industry players from the European side have some complaints. I believe during the long process of transition, domestically speaking, um, we have different opinions, we have different discussion points inside China. Many people refuse to listen to the criticism from EU. Others welcome the criticism from the EU. 
Um, they believe we can use the criticism, that we can use the voice of criticism to speed up our reform and opening up process. I sincerely wish friends from the Borgel Institute could listen to the explanation and clarification from the Chinese colleagues so you could have more opportunities to understand um, to understand the leading group of deepening reform uh, that appears in the 19th National Congress report. So you could have more information of the plan. You can look at the situation dynamically rather than having a stable or non-dynamic picture. Of course, at the same time, we will listen carefully to the recommendations and suggestions from our Burgle colleagues. We will bring the recommendations and the suggestions back to China and further study them. At present, some media coverage used some instigation or sensational ways to comment on the status quo of China and the Chinese economy. It seems during the past several years, these media presses held a positive view on China. All of a sudden, overnight, they turned their direction of the wind to criticize or provide a negative comment on Chinese com on economy. I would like to mention the, the several points. Uh, is Chinese economy a dominant economy by state-owned enterprises? State-owned economy account for some share. Sometimes it's misleading. The biggest, the lion's share of the listed companies are these listed companies, uh, these listed companies, state-owned companies, or a mixture ownership companies. In the middle of the 1990s, we carried out privatization of state-owned enterprises. It is something like the competition neutral um, OECD enterprises, something like the competent competition neutral neutrality or or competition neutrality arrangement. After the 1990s, China carried out the shares reform and the company governance reform. Many companies are becoming are become I mean became publicly listed companies. Before the financial crisis, these reforms has been finished. After that, the private shares, foreign shares, and the shares from the pension fund account for a lion's share. We have come to note that many important industries like petroleum industry, national grid, internet industry, as well as insurance companies, they are all companies of this type. But if we talk about the statistics and different shareholders, different stakeholders have a different understanding. They regard this part as the state-owned share, and, and other parties might regard this part as the private share. If we use different calculation method, and there will be different understanding of the structure of the ownership of a company. So whether a company is a state-owned company or not, and is quite difficult to say. I mean, different people have different understanding. State-owned enterprise um, does not mean it has national subsidy. In the middle of the 1990s, the fiscal income just accounted for 11% of GDP. Actually, China did not have enough money to subsidize the state-owned enterprises. Therefore, in the middle of the 1990s, the country would show the limited responsibility. At present, the fiscal situation is getting better. It only accounts for 20% of GDP, I mean the fiscal income. It's lowering than the average number of other developing countries. So the fiscal load, uh, the expenditure pressure is quite huge. There is rarely an opportunity for the central government to carry out a systematic subsidy system. 
Another aspect is that Chinese economy pays great attention to IPR protection and the protection of commercial confidentiality. The issues you focused and you paid attention to was true and did exist in China. Um, our Premier Li Keqiang also commented on this. And there are some laws and regulations starting from quite some time ago, uh, but the implementation of the laws and the regulations need to be reinforced. We welcome pressure from the EU side. Therefore, we could more effectively implement the rules and the laws of IPR protection. Under such circumstances, uh, there will still be some rare cases of intellectual property stealing, or infringement of intellectual property protection. I think we need to further analyze what industry, what technology, or what innovation um, needs to be further protected. Some, the majority of technological companies and innovation companies are based on research and development. The investment and in investment in research and development has been growing in China. So some specific cases, some single cases should not be exaggerated, I should say. Intellectual rights property is based on scientific knowledge and the spreading of knowledge and the spreading of scientific knowledge is natural and uh, and they are from education investment as well as innovation rate as well as basic infrastructure. If we look at Chinese internet companies, China actually enters into a tick off stage of technology and innovation. Discussion in this respect um, should be more objectively focused on the actual situation in China. The outward investment of China, if I judge from the statistics of the financial industry, most the lion's share of the investment outward is to get more profit so this is a profit-driven investment. There are some small number of investment projects that are used to acquire technology, but quite a small number of them. Secondly, um, state-owned banks are lending only to state-owned enterprises, and the interest rate is quite low. This equals to another way of government subsidy. There are some voices in this regard. I believe these voices are exaggerated. We have the chief economist from Bank of China present here today with us, and he could answer your questions. Besides, many major financial institutions and major financial banks have a deep understanding of Chinese financial industry. The loan of SOEs in China just accounts for the proportion of the SOEs in the GDP. So we have to think about the publicly listed companies in this regard. All in all, ladies and gentlemen, to reinforce the understanding between China and EU. We need to objectively look at is some issues and analyze them. Last but not least, China has been supporting EU. Our Premier Li Keqiang has always been saying to support a strong and uh, unified euro. China's foreign exchange saving has been heavily invested in Eurozone um, bonds. When Eurozone has difficulties, we tried our best to help the Eurozone. 
China and EU countries are working hard to reform WTO as well as the implementation of Paris Agreement. Therefore, China wishes to cooperate with EU to further develop the business opportunities offered by One Belt, One Road Initiative. I sincerely wish this seminar could be a successful forum and we can make new friends. We reinforce the cooperation and understanding between these two parties. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Vice Chairman, for this um, very comprehensive and enlightening speech. And thank you also to Hermann von Rompuy and to our friends from CCIE uh, to be here today with us. I understand uh, you will uh, have to leave. Um, uh, so we turn now to, uh, to our first um, uh, panel discussion and kickoff presentations um, where um, I would like to ask each presenter to um, restrict um, the size of the intervention to no more than, um, <clears throat> I would say, 10 to 15 minutes. We are already um, uh, well over time and we do want to have time for a discussion in the group. Um, and uh, therefore, please, um, if, you, if you can cut a bit your presentation and shorten it a bit, uh, that would be welcome. Um, I think the first uh, presenter will then be uh, Mr. Uh, Miguel uh, Ceballos Baron, Deputy Head of um, the um, Cabinet of the EU Trade Commissioner, Cecilia Malmström. Thank you very much, uh, Miguel, for, for being with us today. Um, it's a real pleasure to host you. And let me just say goodbye to our guest. Miguel, please, the floor is, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. Uh, thank you to Bruegel for this invitation and for bringing so many high-level speakers to the event today. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. Today, we are witnessing a peaceful confrontation between the United States and China. This is what some academics also call a strategic competition for influence and dominance in the world economy. The good news is that this confrontation, as I said, is peaceful. In the past, confrontation between the uh, uh, consolidated powers and an emerging power would eventually be uh, conducted through military uh, solutions. The good news is that this is done today in a peaceful manner through the economy, through trade. This is what some people call a trade war. But I insist this is good news compared to other ways in the past to solve uh, different uh, confrontations. As you know, China has been a developing uh, country, an emerging economic power. I will put a, a, a very particular date on 2001 when China joined the WTO and uh, the, uh, the uh, export increased uh, dramatically since ever. The emergence, the economic emergence of China uh, created some concern from the very beginning. Uh, I would recall that uh, back in the, uh, at the beginning of uh, after China's accession to WTO, there was a big surge of textiles coming into Europe. That was an early warning that China was uh, a big uh, trading player and had to be uh, watched carefully. So China had to reassure the world about its emergency, uh, its emergence as a power. That's why China developed the concept of a peaceful rise or peaceful development. Uh, that China was not seeking dominance through military powers or in an aggressive manner, it will do it in a, in a peaceful manner. That concept was broadly used during the uh, term of uh, President Hu Jintao in, in the uh, 2000, until 2010. But the peaceful rise by China was seen in the United States and to some extent in the European Union as a challenge to the existing status quo in the, uh, in the world economy but also in diplomacy and to some extent in the, in the military side. Nowadays, we are also watching the, this uh, uh, race and dominance in the uh, technology, research, innovation, and science. 
you know what happened. The uh, United States uh, initially responded to this peaceful rise with a pivot to Asia. The United States tried to reinforce its presence in Asia and uh, counter the growing Chinese influence in all the fields. The pivot to Asia by the United States uh, was acting in three uh, main areas. In the economy and trade, the United States joined the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. That was all in Asia-Pacific but China. In the diplomatic field, the uh, United States reinforces its presence in APEC, uh, East Asia Summit, uh, reinforcing and strengthening and supporting the regional integration of the uh, 10 South e Southeast Asian countries, ASEAN. And the United States increases military presence uh, with uh, new bases uh, in Darwin, Australia, and also including the deployment of the uh, Terminal High Altitude Area Defense in South Korea that was uh, not welcome in Beijing. The European Union response to, to China's in increasing presence in the world economy uh, and, uh, and growing uh, influence in technology and industrial capacity. We responded in a different manner. We didn't have a pivot to Asia. Uh, we simply uh, start increasing our trade and economic and investment agreements with the most advanced economies, with Canada, with South Korea, with Japan, with Australia, New Zealand, Mexico, Brazil, Mercosur, undergoing. And with the United States on what we call the uh, Trans-Pacific, uh, sorry, the Transatlantic Investment uh, and Trade Partnership, TTIP. So at some point, two years ago, in 2016, it seemed as the Western world had agreed to further integrate among themselves and isolate, exclude China from the equation. The TPP, the Trans-Pacific plus the TTIP, were more than a simple uh, trade agreement uh, cutting tariffs. They were more than trade and investment agreements. They were designed to develop new <coughs> technical rules, uh, standards, regulatory cooperation, uh, all that to counter China's influence in the uh, decision making of the uh, future economy. We could eventually allow, I mean, the thinking was we could uh, let China continue being the world's factory, but uh, the, the will was that the, the future standards and rules would be made by someone else and not China. That was very much the thinking in the United States, is what uh, Hillary Clinton, the former uh, Secretary of State, called, that's why they, she called TTIP as the economic NATO. Uh, it was more than, for them, it was more uh, than a simple trade agreement, as I said. We never in Europe call it uh, uh, economic NATO. We didn't like this uh, reference to the Cold War. For us, TT TTIP was more judged on, on its own economic merits. That was to increase transatlantic trade and um, have more business opportunity in the United States. Obviously, uh, China was observing all these movements. I will not simply accept to be uh, isolated from, from the decision making in, in world trade. That's why China responded by setting up its own instrument to influence the, uh, the, the, the world and the global economy. It set up the One Belt, One Road, also now more recently called Belt and, and Road Initiative, to uh, extend its influence and, uh, and build new alliances with uh, countries, initially in Asia, uh, but now, uh, as I understand, the uh, Belt and Road Initiative is open to all the countries in the world that want to, to cooperate closer, closely with, uh, with China. But all this is a scenario of some trying to counter and isolate China and China responding with a new initiative uh, to counter this uh, uh, offensive, all this is a scenario blew, blew up with the arrival of Donald Trump to the White House. You know? immediately uh, first uh, withdrawal of the United States from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, putting the TTIP in the fridge, and then challenging all relations with traditional allies in Europe, America, and Asia. This initial change was uh, probably seen with relief in Beijing, um, but uh, as you know, Trump immediately moved into direct 
economic confrontation with China on what uh, the press is calling trade wars. And the most visible part of it is the, uh, the, uh, the trade tariffs, the tariff duties imposed on, uh, on Chinese exports. But as the situation is today, these uh, duties are not affecting so much for the time being the uh, trade flows. But there are other measures that are not uh, often so much mentioned by the press that are, in my view, even more important and uh, could have a, a, a bigger impact on uh, US-China uh, relations. First, the uh, blocking of Chinese investments in the United States uh, through CFUs, and now more recently with the new reform system, FIRMA, that uh, would definitely tie up uh, Chinese investment in the United States. As a consequence, the uh, Chinese foreign investment in the United States has reached its lowest point in, in, in history, probably. And China now, uh, has, as our speakers have mentioned before, China is <coughs> investing more in the European Union than in the United States, according to the latest figures. At least China is investing eight times more in Europe than in, in the United States. Equally important is the, uh, the uh, recent bans on export technology from the United States to, to China. You, you've seen um, the uh, sanctions imposed on the uh, telecom um, uh, manufacturer ZTE uh, that uh, provoked mostly the, uh, the stop of production on, on that company after uh, the, uh, the, uh, the ban to export advanced semiconductors and memory chips. A very third important um, measure that the United States is taking that is not so much uh, mentioned in the press is the new restrictions on visas to uh, Chinese students and researchers traveling in the United States. This is, this is really serious and it will, in my view, have a long-term effect on, the, uh, on China's uh, capacity to increase its uh, technology uh, research and science. Where we stand as the European Union, well, uh, we, we share some of the analysis, diagnosis made by the, uh, by the Americans about the, uh, the situation of the Chinese economy. As you know, the European Union, the European Commission believes that China is not a market economy. Uh, we have uh, published in December last year uh, a thorough report, very detailed, uh, on, uh, on the state of the, uh, of the Chinese economy and why we believe there is still uh, important distortions that do not qualify as a, as a market economy. The, the role of state-owned enterprises, the uh, strong hand of the, of the state in the economy, the forced transfer of technology, uh, state subsidies give an unfair advantage to Chinese operators. But also the lack of transparency, the independence of a judiciary make it very difficult for EU investors operate in China. We need more level playing field in that sense between uh, foreign and domestic operators in the Chinese market. The peaceful confrontation uh, uh, has provoked a first victim. It, this is the uh, multilateral trade system, the WTO. But we cannot only blame the United States. I think uh, there are all, many other are responsible for that. I will mention that also China is responsible for the lack of uh, reform in, uh, in WTO. Remember that China was at the end the only one blocking an agreement on environmental goods a few months ago. That was uh, probably was going to be the first uh, agreement to be negotiated since the Uruguay round, um, and China did not contribute to this exercise. Also, the, uh, the utilization China does sometimes about the dispute settlement uh, system in WTO as a retaliation tool against uh, anti-dumping imposed by other partners. Uh, this is also creating tension into the system and not facilitating the good functioning of WTO. In any case, uh, this is more about per human perception and, and human sentiments. Uh, many in the United States and the European Union are disappointed about the way China has evolved over the last 20 years. Well, this is human, but uh, as I said, many were expecting uh, 20 years ago that China would evolve towards a market economy. Maybe not as a market economy in the sense we understand in Europe or America, but at least something similar to the evolution, the transition that uh, South Korea or Japan have made in the past. 
while this did not happen, we are not at the same level of, uh, of transition, and this is the disappointing. Many also believe that the economic reforms and the opening up would eventually also drive political reforms in China. And I remember people always say, saying, well, it would be a matter of time that China may eventually transform into a kind of a democracy like uh, South Korea or, or Singapore or, or Japan. And even one day could be uh, uh, free elections with a multi-party uh, representation. Well, all that has not happened, as you know. Uh, China never committed to that, of course. I say this is a frustration in many people's mind in Europe and United States, but that also helps to understand what's, what's happening, why there is such a frustration. Most of the economic and political reforms uh, were, were halted in China, uh, in particular after the uh, financial crisis in 2008. Uh, even some opening and reforms were reversed. I will mention, uh, as has also been mentioned by the previous speakers, the, uh, the freedom uh, and the restrictions for the internet. Back in 2008, uh, Google, Facebook, Twitter were available in China with little or no censorship. Uh, this is not the situation today, so today uh, definitely the uh, freedom uh, in, uh, in internet is worse than it was 10 years ago, so there is a reverse trend. I will uh, finish here with, a, with a, a small short reflection on what is next, so what else can we do now? I think we all have to work uh, towards uh, uh, stop the escalation on the uh, trade uh, rhetoric and uh, uh, stop imposing uh, new trade uh, tariffs, uh, duties. I think it's very important for China to uh, speed up uh, the uh, economic uh, reforms that have been announced in 2013. I did that was a speech uh, last year, and in particular, to see uh, concrete uh, measures uh, on, the, uh, on the state interference influence in the economy, the role of the state-owned enterprises, new concrete measures to stop the uh, forced transfer of technology, more transparency and level playing field uh, of uh, foreign and domestic operators in the market. China uh, and the United States and the European Union should uh, accelerate the, uh, the, the work on the reform of WTO and uh, uh, drive the, uh, the debate within the uh, multilateral uh, fora rather than in bilateral exchanges. For the European Union and China, we have a, a duty of uh, finalizing the uh, comprehensive agreement on investment that will send a strong signal to the world that we are able to, to to reform, to speak, and for China to consolidate the reforms. As Mr. Zhou said, that would also help those in China who want to reform the economy and uh, would also uh, anchor these reforms into a bilateral agreement. So the key, in my view, and that's probably a bit has been mentioned today by other speakers, is the uh, resumption and acceleration of reforms in China, phasing out state subsidies. Uh, and the role of state-owned enterprises. Opening up is market, level playing field, to more space to private business, private initiative, as it was announced in 2013, and in the Davos speech. We need more domestic consumption in China. Allow salaries to increase, further opening up the financial markets to operate in a more efficient manner. Eliminate investment restrictions like the uh, joint ventures, um, and the investment caps, or the party sales presence in business. The European Union stands ready to work with China, uh, as we have done in the last 20 years in good faith, uh, sharing our experience on reforms and uh, continue collaboration in all the fields that are of mutual interest. And we want to continue uh, working with China, as we have already started through our bilateral uh, working group on the reform of WTO. Thank you. So our next speaker is uh, Mr. Wang Tsongtse, Executive Vice President from <coughs> CIIS. And if, if you would like to come here, because Mr. Van Rompuy is there, so we, we can free that, uh, that seat actually. Uh,
Um, and if if there is someone who wants to sit there, uh, please. Oh, let's take the nameplate. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. It's my great honor to be here and also to speak to such a very distinguished audience. Uh, actually, I'll switch to Chinese in order to put myself uh, across. Um, distinguished delegates, it's my honor and a pleasure to attend this high-level seminar. Just now, several delegates talked about different aspects of the relationship. Excellent. Because of time constraint, I would like to talk about three opinions. From the first half of the discussion of today, we could observe that when we are talking about the China-EU-US relations, there are some new words, new expressions appearing. For example, trade wall, unilateralism, global leadership, global responsibility, etc., as well as the uncertainty of future development. I would like to emphasize today is that there is a new saying which is called fairness and um, equivalent or reciprocity. When I carried out the communication with U.S. friends, they talked about fairness, equal. In that sense, when they are dealing with China, and they are being taken advantage by China, therefore they are emphasizing fairness and reciprocity. This is the idea I would like to expand. My personal opinion on fairness is that this is not a topic to discuss at all. This is a pseudo topic of discussion. When my U.S. friends talked about fairness to me, I talked back to him. How could U.S. be fair to everybody? U.S. is the superpower. If you want to be fair and equal with others, where is America? America exists because America is a superpower. Nobody, no el nobody else could be equal to the United States of America. If the world is equal and fair, so what is the status of America? Fairness or reciprocity? I believe these are the words and voices from the weak. Only the weak cry for fairness, cry for equality. I have never heard a straw man crying out for equality, for fairness. So today, as the superpower of the world, United States of America wants to be fair and equal with other smaller and developing countries. When I carried out a communication with my European friends, they were talking about Fairness and reciprocity are key words. It's easy to say these words, but my problem with these two words are if EU citizens are feeling that you are not feeling treated equally or fairly, you should talk about this to U.S. If you are talking to the developing countries, including China, there will be a problem. Where is the problem? What is the problem? For example, if China, uh, if EU and the US are talking about fairness and reciprocity to China, let me ask yourself some questions. Why US citizen should be the chair of IMF, or EU citizen, or a EU candidate should be the chair of the World Bank? So why should you monopolize the candidate of the president or the chair of IMF or World Bank? Because American people are smart, because American people are wise, this is not fair. So could you start from yourself? The, so the U.S. will stay away from the candidature of the president of World Bank, European people staying away from the from the IMF. So what is reciprocity? What is fairness? Another aspect. 
many people have this idea. They say us. They are saying China rises, U.S. fails, EU fails. In 2012, China entered or joined WTO. China developed, so WTO failed. Therefore, WTO needs to be reformed. These type of understanding needs further explanation. From the perspective of history, because a story is told differently. Let's take a recent example. The recent example shows China entered WTO. China contributed significantly to world economy and world peace. During the Cold War period, China and the EU formed a closer relationship against the threats from USSR. After September the 11th, China and EU, uh, China and the US reinforced their efforts against the terrorism. After the financial crisis in 2008, EU, China, developing countries, and the US are working very hard to prevent the further spreading of the crisis. So the world was saved. In 2008, I was working in the Chinese embassy in the United States of America. When the financial crisis broke out, everybody was shocked. At the G7 meeting, uh, you know, G7 meeting was authorized to deal with these issues. But why the G7 was not used to deal with these financial crises? I believe EU and the US believed only G7 cannot be enough to solve this world crisis. We needed a new system. We needed a new mechanism. The new mechanism was G20. Why G20 was a success? Because inside of G20 countries, there are a lot of emerging economies and developing countries. That's why G20 group successfully led the fight against the possible spread of further financial crisis. G20 has become a excellent platform for government, for global governments, because it has more ability, more willingness, more stability to solve the problems. Let's remember, 10 years ago, the financial crisis helped to helped us to understand the rising of emerging economies, the emerging of developing countries were not a threat to U.S. or to the EU. I believe China-U.S. China relationship has two uh, defining points because U.S. started the trade war. China had to rise up against the oars of the war. At the present, the U.S. administration is trying to change the policy that was exercised by the past administrations. In 1977, China-U.S. established diplomatic ties. We believe China-U.S. relationship is a win-win and a mutual beneficial relationship. China and U.S. are the two biggest economies. Any war, any trade war will lead to the disastrous impact or a backtrack of the world economy. I, let me give you another example. During the past, China's economy reform and opening up, China did one thing, that is getting the Chinese system closely connected to the international rules. It is different from the former practice by USSR. This practice actually led to a win-win situation. For one thing, the international rules become more rational, more representative. And on the other hand, for China, if China participated actively in the rule making or the rule changing, China acquired a better and a bigger opportunity of development. Next, let's come to the US EU and China EU relations. We have observed the relationship between EU and US is not a smooth ride. Not a long ago, President Trump 
mentioned that EU is the biggest enemy of the U.S. Of course, the leaders of the EU said this is a fake news. EU is the best friend of U.S. I don't know who is the one saying the lies. That means China, that means U.S. and EU are redefining their relationship, and these redefining of relationship has some impact or influence on international relations. From the integration process of EU, EU is committed to unification, committed to globalization, because unification and globalization will bring unification and unity of EU and prosperity of EU and EU competitiveness will be reinforced, more jobs will be created. So from this perspective, I believe in the future EU will be committed to multilateralism. But let's remember the financial crisis that happened 10 years ago. That crisis impaired EU significantly. The problems between China, EU, China, US, I should say, some are caused by the financial crisis. What are the consequences of the financial crisis? Because in the EU, uh, the sovereignty debt crisis, in 2014, the Crimea crisis, immigration problems, as well as uh, terrorism. All these crises are overlapping with each other. EU has intention to look inside because you have more and more of your problems. There are two ways out. One way is to look for answers inside. The second method is to blame outsiders. So in EU, in some countries, the protectionism is on the rise. I should be candid and honest with everybody here now. When U.S. was amending its CFUs to filler, EU is actually adjusting its outward investment arrangement. I believe the arrangement, in some degree, to some degree, is aiming at China. So U.S.-EU relationship well, um, will be specific on issue-oriented agenda. And there might be some discrepancy between these two parts of the world. China-EU relation, on the other hand, um, I should say EU has a double-track approach to China. On the one hand, EU wants to have a more cooperation with China to get more development opportunities. At the same time, the EU is worried that China's success will weaken the soft power of EU. China's rise will damage the rule of law of EU. This is the conflict. This is the dilemma of EU. We have talked about the problems. What are we going to do? What are the solutions in the future? For one thing, we need to look at the past 10 years. Let's look back the time of 10 years. Have we learned enough from the past 10 years? My answer is no. We didn't learn enough. When the crisis came, everybody was saying, yes, let's fight together. When the crisis is over, we come back to our own house and exercise protectionism. This protectionism is an impairment to the future, to the future development under such circumstances. Um, EU in the past relied on law and rules as the leadership. And now EU relies on rules and laws for internal unity. Next, America first. America first does not have to achieve fairness with everybody. It is the American exception. Of course, China has its own special characteristics. Under these circumstances, we need to come back to the multilateralism. What is multilateralism? Multilateralism is an emphasis on variety. Multilateralism is beneficial to everybody. Thank, thank you very much for these wise words. I'm now turning to Alicia Garcia Herrero, our senior fellow and expert on China. Um, thank you very much, Kuntram. Uh, thank you uh, for the invitation and for all of the participants from China to have come all the way. 
and to have shared uh, precious information for us um, at a time where the world really is at a crossroads, uh, not only for trade, but actually for economic relations overall. And this is why this meeting is indeed very important. I'm going to be very brief. I'm going to cover uh, four issues very briefly. One is what is the US really trying to do uh, with this trade war? Uh, I'm going to try to then also understand how China is reacting very quickly uh, and where the US stands in the midst of these two uh, hegemons. Uh, maybe I would say existing hegemon, wannabe hegemon, but both real hegemons, and, and we feel in Europe as, you know, somehow in between this very difficult uh, uh, economic um, situation between the two. And, and then once, once I do that, I look at EU-China as a potential block. How can we uh, withstand the U.S. pressure? Because we also have U.S. pressure. It's not only China. Maybe it's more veiled and less uh, apparent, but it's still there. So uh, on the first, prom uh, first point, U.S. objectives, I think uh, our reading um, of what the U.S. is really trying to do after all of this measure is really to contain China. And I don't think we can talk about trade deficit when the U.S. has actually imposed tariffs on, on, on issues that, on goods that China does not yet export to the U.S. So it's, so it's very, very obvious that the U.S. is trying to target the upper end of the value chain which China is already producing, maybe not necessarily exporting to the US, but clearly intends to produce even more with this China manufacture in 2025. So that's the US objective. Uh, I would also argue that with the incoming 200 billion package of additional import tariffs on China, the, object, the second objective, which is also related, but interestingly somewhat different, is to reshore away from China or to re-offshore elsewhere, not China. And I can think of Vietnam, I can think of Mexico, the actual renegotiation of the bilateral agreement with Mexico is kind of interesting nowadays. How come that happened after we thought it would not happen? And I think it's happening because the US is trying to find other sourcing venues other than China to depend less on China, even for its imports of production. So it's not only stopping China on, on the upper end of this value chain, but also kind of depending less on China on the low end of the value chain. So this, you know, if I were China, I would also be kind of worried about this because these are two key issues for China today and, and for any country that is trying to become an hegemon. So um, China's reaction. So how would you react to this? I guess the, the kind of the immediate reaction would be, I'm going to do exactly the same. And at the beginning of the first list that China put up, uh, the 50 billion first list, there was a little bit of that. You know, you, you, you stop aircraft that I'm not even exporting to you, I export your air, aircraft. And I think there's a Boeing representative here, I just checked the list. But they finally did not. They finally excluded aircraft. They fi the Chinese, they finally excluded even semiconductors. Rightly so. Rightly so. T today, China actually imports in value more semiconductors than oil, which really means that China needs those semiconductors to move up the ladder until it can produce them <laughs> itself. So, so in a way, China, I think, with the benefit of hindsight, there was couple of months to think about it, about this properly, you know, with the visits back and forth, thought, wait a minute, this is a trap. I should actually, if anything, fasten, move even faster towards my uh, ultimate goal, which is moving up the ladder. And I'm not going to impose tires on myself, yeah, because I still need these products, rightly so. But this does not uh, dispel the risk because the, the target is there. The world has changed, in other words. It's like suddenly the US has woken up to this reality. 
And yes, China can make it cheaper to import, but eventually it could even be unable to import these semiconductors. We don't really know because this is a chess game. And I, lo I like the uh, expression, this is a chess game. When the US sees what, how China is reacting, it will now react in a different way to ultimately achieve its goal, which is containing China moving up the ladder. And thus, I think, uh, in a way, uh, and I'm not arguing that China doesn't have any other ways to react to the US, but trade-wise, I, I do think that there is very little that China can do. China, though, can, and this comes to my third point, Europe, can certainly um, speed up its acquisition of technology. And that's where Europe comes to the forefront. I can't uh, but share the data that was uh, unveiled as to how much uh, China's investment in the US has been reduced, especially in industrial technology. There's not, we, we looked at M&A data, and I think uh, one more uh, Bruegel uh, fellow, uh, Jiang Wei Shu, who is working intensively on M&A data and, and is looking at us now in our live stream, um, uh, told me, I can't find a single transaction of uh, M&A transaction of Chinese <coughs> purchases of industrial technology in the US in 2017, as bad as that. And I can actually find hundreds of them in Europe, hundreds of them. I mean, it's basically, if you exclude the UK, most of the acquisitions that China has conducted in Europe in 2017 are industrial technology. So we are the sourcing venue for China's, I am kind of making it a little bit, uh, sound a little bit uh, maybe dramatic, but you know, the, I, I'm trying to raise the understanding that we are the sourcing venue for China's manufacturing 2025, 20, at least in some sectors. And is this good or bad for Europe? Maybe eventually, if we come up with something that is agreeable, both for China and Europe, regarding this massive challenge, which is the current US administration. I'm not saying it isn't, but we need, as European, we need to be aware. We need to be aware of what's happening. Um, so Europe stands right there. I, I, Europe stands in this idea that on the investment side, we're reducing our investment into China. Reluctantly and reluctantly, it's very hard to judge. Is it because of barriers? Is it because we have less muscle to invest? You know, it, it, it's, a, it's an open question. I only, I do not want to put all of the burden on our Chinese colleagues, but this is a reality. Let alone the fact that the stock of FDI in China is very small compared to the US. So we are strapped in a massive investment over decades that we've conducted in the US, as opposed to a small investment and increasingly less that we have in China. And on the other hand, as regards trade, we are kind of reluctantly, but interestingly, in the midst of this trade war, which of course is not good for anybody like Europe or you know massive trade surplus, but could be good for some sectors if we can step in in things that the US will no longer export to China or the other way around. But very importantly, to understand Europe's response, and I'm not going to talk about the transatlantic alliance or our historical alliance. I'm going to talk about business here. We export so much more to the US. It's not only the stock of investment that may delay or may make us hesi hesitate about our support. It's really about the flow. We export much more to the US than to China. And I think the question for China then is, I certainly need allies. We, we do, too. No worries. You're not alone on this one. But you know, if, you, if China really needs alliances, the question is, and this is a little bit maybe controversial, but I want to say it, shouldn't China have been more, quote unquote, generous before? on its opening, because now it's very hard. The stock of investment is right there, and it doesn't pay off for us to challenge the US. This is the, the, the key message. Europe will like it or not. I understand that China will be the largest market in the world. I understand that very well. I live in Hong Kong, so I, I don't need to be convinced about this one. But 
the stock matters. The stock matters. And stock-wise, it's very costly for Europe to move, to even uh, contemplate the idea of not following the US if push comes to shelf. And you know, push will come to shelf because this is the US uh, strategy to contain China. It's a structural st strategy. I don't think this is a midterm election issue. So, so now, I truly believe that for China to have more of a chance to bring Europe closer, I wouldn't say all the way, but you know, closer, at least not to avoid that alliance, uh, I think China really needs to open up. It, it's, it's not about uh, you know, convincing arguments that we may have had for many years in Europe, and, and I understand those arguments, but it's not about that. It's about a strategic decision that will help Europe align. And now we can go to what is needed, which is the last point. How can Europe and China align? Or not to the extent of perhaps expecting Europe to ever you know, forget about the US. That's very difficult for Europe. But at least to, to play more of a, a kind of ambivalent role that it may play otherwise. Well, I think for that matter, what really needs to be understood is how to increase, entice European businesses' interest in China. After years of this disenchantment, and it's not me saying that, it's the European Chamber saying that, whether right or wrong, in a way, doesn't really matter too much at this point in time. It doesn't really matter too much. I think it's important to read what were the concerns and see whether these concerns can be uh, to some extent, you know, addressed. And of course, as Europeans, maybe we also have to learn from China's policies in as far as we may have been lacking some of those policies because of our very strong alliance with the US. And I can think of industrial policy in Europe, which may have to revisit. But, but I'm going to focus, I'm not a European expert, I'm going to focus on what China could do. Uh, and again, not saying that Europe can't do anything. And, um, I, and if I just think of um, the two obvious measures, one is, of course, market access. So, you, so market as access means that European companies, either through trade or investment, can reap more gains in China. And, and we could think, you know, uh, the unthinkable. I say the unthinkable because we've worked on a report for, for a long time discussing bilateral investment agreement, free trade agreement, you know. But the point is market access seems to be blocked after all of those discussions we had by the uh, fact that we do not seem to agree on what economic model would be behind those trade and investment relations. So it's not only in, uh, market access doesn't seem to be enough because even in sectors where we do have market access, it doesn't seem to be happening so what is behind that lack of interest, in other words? And I give one very important example. China finally, and I've been following this topic for so many years, I was so proud when I saw the communique, that China now allows for 51, i.e. control of a financial institution, a bank in China, which, you know, it's been so decades that, uh, that, that the world has been waiting for this. And now it's announced two weeks ago so how come there's been no reaction on this humongous measure? How come? It's because the world is not really fully believing, and I'm talking about Europe now, that this is real. And if that's the case, it's very worrisome. Because even if you take uh, decisions, the second one you took, which is also very important, I do believe that there was a lot of US pressure on this one, is to make it seem easier for foreigners to acquire companies on your stock market. Yeah? So that's a second big one that you have announced with a little, I mean, hardly any media coverage. I mean, how come? The, before, this would have been humongous measures. Everybody would have been, you know, uh, cheering China for them. How come? So I guess there is part of a credibility story, I'm afraid. And second, there is also the idea, and this is my last point, and most important point, because it was... Uh, uh, widely uh, discussed before on the actual economic model. 
where uh, the ownership of production comes to the forefront. So I think as Europeans, it's hard to argue that the state doesn't play a role in Europe. In, uh, of course, in the provision of services, i.e. whatever is called welfare state in our. So, you know, we understand that part. But China's role of the state is more on the provision of goods, I mean, on the actual production of goods and services, perhaps, but meaning is the supply side. Yeah, it's, it's a very different uh, model, which, by the way, some European countries, and I know that you did some research on this, actually had in the past, but do not have anymore in the way we see it in China. Now, I can understand that there's many ways to look at the role of SOS in China. We heard um, a few things about mixed ownership, which, which is interesting. But you know, for us, I'm, I'm going to give you just a number of why it's so hard for Europe to understand your wording of, of mixed ownership. If you look at any of these companies that were referred as mixed ownership, Sinopec, Sinopec, uh, the float of Sinopec on, in the stock market is 6.9%. Uh, Electricité de France, EDF, is 29%. But we think EDF is a state-owned company. You know, this is the problem. For us, if you only list 6.9%, that's a state-owned company. I mean, and I think there's a lot of you know, we're so far apart in what we think is a state-owned company to what you think is a state-owned company that it's very hard to have a dialogue. Not that we don't believe your figures. Of course, we do. You know your economy so much better than we do. But we just don't speak the same language on this topic. And I think this is extremely important. Of course, you may say we don't have subsidies. Maybe not, not directly, but, you know, I was trying to calculate... Um, uh, the interest burden of a, of a state-owned company as opposed to a private company in China for the same level of leverage. So it's literally 25% cheaper to borrow. And now this brings me to the, to the, to the banking sector. Yeah? If you look at state-owned banks, out of which ICBC, as an example, 6.9% float only, again. So for us, this is a state-owned bank. No matter how we, you know, we can't avoid thinking about it as a state-owned bank. So if we sum all of those state-owned banks, let alone other joint stone commercial banks, whose float is also well below control, I mean, meaning they're still controlled by local governments, it's virtually most of the banking sector in China, most by most, I mean, more than 80%. So of course, it's easier to get credit. I am not judging the subsidies because you know it would be a long story, but I'm just saying, with such state-owned companies are two-thirds of listed companies. And then I agree that maybe the employment is less on the industrial sector is less, but I'm saying for us European, it's a very state-owned, driven, if not dominated, production model. Not welfare, production. So if you ask a European company, would you operate there? It's not only about market access, it's what I'm going to do there. Will I have any chance? And this is the ultimate key point, in my opinion, to discuss. Because it would be very arrogant for Europeans to try to change your economic model. I think this is not the discussion, should not be the discussion. But the question is how to accommodate that um, equal footing, how to make it uh, feasible so that Europe sees the benefits of this, I wouldn't say full alliance, because frankly I think it's going to be, but at least not, not going all the way to, to an alliance US, uh, Europe that would be extremely uh, dangerous, not only for China, not only for China, for the world. Because that's the wrong alliance, I think, for Europeans uh, in the state of uh, of the world we find ourselves today. So I would leave it there. I think the whole idea is how to come up with a solution that is agreeable uh, so that Europe sees more of those benefits that unfortunately are hard to see today because of fear of this model. Maybe we should know more, I agree. But beyond knowledge, I think we should also have some kind of secure, more secure environment to what we see 
with, without expecting to change your model, which is, of course, the one you have chosen. We have no right to do that. But I think this is where the two things clash, and it's so important for Europe and China to discuss this. Uh, I would say, uh, you know, it's of the essence to discuss it as soon as possible, because we cannot, and this is my last word, we cannot expect multilateralism to come back out of nowhere and, 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 and basically uh, save us all or save us some, Europe and China. I don't think this is going to happen. So we need to move fast in trying to solve this dilemma of our economic models. Yeah, thank you. OK, la last but not least, uh, um, our colleague Zhang Yangsheng, principal researcher at the CCIE. Um, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, first of all. This time last year, Wolf and I published, I mean, the four institutions co-published a report about the 2020 China-EU economic relationship called Building the Future. In that report, ladies and gentlemen, CCIE, together with Bruegel Institute, Chatham House, as is Hong Kong Chinese University, these four institutes mentioned seven recommendations. The first recommendation is that China and the EU are two important parts of the world. We sincerely wish the BIT, Bilateral Investment Treaty, should be reached as soon as possible. We have observed recently the BIT uh, lists were exchanged. The second recommendation from the report was that China and the EU will, as soon as possible, start the FTA negotiation, free trade agreement negotiation. What we wanted to see is that a high-level FTA could come into being. Alicia mentioned in detail very excellently. I mean, the high-level FTA does need capacity building. We need capacity building in order to achieve this high-level FTA. The third recommendation is to expand bilateral trade and economic cooperation with the help of the Belt and Road Initiative platform. That is to say, China and EU should work together to expand, explore the third-party market. The fourth recommendation is to deepen cooperation between China and the EU on energy security and climate change. The, four, the fifth recommendation is to focus on new opportunities brought about by cooperation in science, technology, and innovation. In this regard, to reinforce intellectual property protection is key. The sixth recommendation from the report is that China and EU should deepen cooperation in the financial field. One particular focus in this regard is to promote the high level, the top level direct investment market. The seventh recommendation is to contribute to the promotion of global governance improvement. These seven recommendations are the recommendations from the reports, and all these recommendations are still significant to what we are talking about today. Um, in terms of global governance cooperation, uh, we are um, seeing three different ideas. One school of idea is the fair, liberal trade the second is reciprocal free trade. The third is accommodative or inclusive free trade. For the future of the world, we will find that the world presents to us different views and ideas on the same thing. Chinese people believe we are in a change that has never been seen for the past 100 years. This huge change we haven't 
observed since the 1918. So we could remember what happened in 1918 vividly. Populism and unilateralism, protectionism, what they have brought to the world. Now we are in 2018. What we could see is that economy is stable, economy is going up. Unfortunately, the trade war broke out. I asked myself for three questions. The first question. What is the global governance structure based on fair trade rules? In the future, the global governance is a global governance or America first or everybody from all countries first. This is my first concern. The second question I ask myself is that if the superpowers are no longer willing to sit on the steering seat, who will provide the global public goods? If we cannot solve this problem, the future of our world will go into disorder. The third question I ask myself is the challenges the rule-based globalization is facing is unfair. It is unfairness. The U.S. people is not happy. U.K. is not happy. Developing countries are not happy. What is the common problem? The common problem is the difficulty of solving the imbalance, the unfairness. With this as a backdrop, we need to think about the world in five years or ten years, what kind of rules can make us all happy? During the past ten years, what China did to the world? During the past decade, in 2017, China's GDP accounted for 15% of the world GDP, but the contribution to the world economic growth from China is above 30%. In 2009, China's GDP accounted for 8.5% of the world GDP, but the contribution to the world economic growth was above 50%. During the past 10 years, China contributed significantly to the economic development. What was the price China paid? During the past 10 years, the leverage level increased by 114%. That means the end of 2008, the leverage rate is 141.3%. At the end of last year, the leverage reached 256%. What we could see in the past 10 years, China used leverage to contribute to the world economy. Now, trade war. My understanding of trade war, the interest rate will go up in US. Possibly there will be two times of interest rate hype. Next step, US will reinforce its investment infrastructure. Trade war? Is trade war used to ask China to increase its leverage level? What are the diverging points? Where do we diverge? 40 years of opening up and reform. China has been learning actively. China has been a good learner. And that China has been an active participant, beneficiary, and a promoter of Western rules. It also, it has always been a um, practitioner of international cooperation. My question is, where is the problem? Many friends might comment that the Chinese market economy has market distortion non-market economy orientation, intellectual property infringement, 
compulsory technology transfer, industrial subsidies, and market access issues. All these issues, what are the Chinese people's view? Is trade war a good way to solve these issues or the problems? Actually, these issues, these problems, are the key points of mutual communication for today. I actually asked myself three questions before I came here. Question number one. Um, is China a mature, developed economy? My answer is no. China is a developing and a transitional country. If we use one index, uh, which is called R&D intensity, to evaluate China, we could see that China has three completely different economies. S um, uh, the eastern seven provinces um, exceed that the OECD, I mean, in terms of R&D intensity. These seven provinces has come into the innovation-driven stage of development. But the inland provinces, the western provinces, I mean, are in the investment-driven stage. They have low R&D intensity. There are 11 provinces in the western part of China. Their R&D intensity is below 1. It is resource-driven stage of development of the economy. Uh, the R&D expenditure of, of Guangdong and Jiangsu is equivalent to uh, 2.5 times the total R&D expenditure of 11 provinces and cities in the West. So if we are looking at China, we need to look at the difference between the eastern part, the western part, and the central part. The eastern part is innovation-driven. The western part is resource-driven. Why do we have these type of uh, divergence? During the past 40 years, we used imbalanced development pro uh, principle to develop market economy. So as a next step, we need a rebalancing strategy to solve the imbalance and inadequacy problems all over China. Therefore, I should say China is still a developing transitional economy. Chinese economy is an economy with a huge divergence and differences. But Chinese economy will bring a lot of opportunities to the world. Till 2020, the mid-income population will reach 600 million. Till 2030, the middle-income population will reach 800 million. Chinese economy is an economy with a high saving ratio, and the number of types of industries is the biggest, I should say. Chinese economy has a huge potential, big re resilience, and a huge room of maneuvering. At the present, Chinese economy is transitioning from a export-driven one to a consumption-driven one. The second question I asked myself is that, is China a non-market economy-oriented? My answer is no. China is a market economy. But the Chinese economy, Chinese market economy is a ecological system. In our market economy, at the age of three, it would stumble. At the age of 12, it would be rebellious. At the age of 18, we are grown up, but we are still immature. Wherever the market economy develops well, there will be vitality, such as Guangdong province and the Zhejiang province. Any company with a strong vitality will have a strong competitiveness, such as Huawei and Media. On the contrary, enterprises that rely on government assistance 
administrative monopoly and a market monopoly profits will sooner or later be eliminated from the market. Therefore, it is unfair to combat to um, impair China's good enterprises such as Huawei and media. My third question is that will China lose its trade war? My answer is no. China has only one possibility to lose. That is, China will defeat itself. After 40 years of reform, the market economy has penetrated into the blood of every Chinese. The trade war will make China more awake. What are we going to do then? We will strengthen intellectual property protection and promote technological innovation. We will develop the real economy and the shift from OEM to independent production. We will promote financial services for the transformation of the real economy, and we will value talents. We will further promote the modernization of the market system, the rule of law, and the government's, uh, governance capac capacity. We will expand domestic demand. We will improve supply quality and achieve balanced development of the economy. Chinese people often say that turning bad things into good things and that China US relations will always shift from irrational confrontation to rational cooperation. China's progress depends on intergenerational change. That is to say, when our children and our grandchildren uh, grow up, China and EU, as well as United States of America, will have a new cooperative relations on the modern level. So from this perspective, I personally have a positive positive vision and hope on the relationship between China, U.S. and the EU. Thank you. Well, thank you very much and uh, also thank you for recalling our previous report um, in which we discuss, of course, the, uh, the relation between, uh, between Europe and China and uh, where we, we did make the point quite clearly that um, you know, given the importance and the potential for more investment uh, between the two, uh, uh, our two economies, there is a need to establish a clear rules-based framework to frame that, uh, that kind of um, investment relation. And I think we also made clear that this would be um, a, a first step uh, in, uh, before discussing um, uh, trade issues or, or anything further. So this, we would have to start with this. And, um, and uh, you know, of course, I think the, the report was also quite realistic at the time in pointing to um, the obstacles and the various different views that we have on, uh, on our respective economies. I think Alicia talked a lot about, um, of course, the state-owned enterprise issue, um, which um, I think many in Europe see as a clear obstacle to moving ahead with, uh, with uh, an investment treaty. Um, so, so indeed, I think this is very good that you bring it back, back again. This is the start of an important discussion, and I'm glad that we can, uh, we do have time now to uh, discuss with the very distinguished audience and get feedback, comments, own remarks. Um, we have a number of experts here, both from China as well as from uh, from Europe. And uh, let me let me open the floor. Um, who would like to speak? Um, and of course, I would have to ask you to uh, make your interventions relatively short because we are actually uh, well. I don't even want to say how much we are. Forty minutes behind time, so we only have uh, 40, 40 minutes uh, for this discussion. So the way we do this, I would say we will ask um, each of you to to really speak very shortly. We collect three, four um, uh, remarks, ideally distributed between Europe and, and China. And then we uh, give, uh, give people um, on the 
uh, on the podium here also a chance to wreck, but perhaps we can really re re collect four, five, six remarks and then have a, a round here. Uh, so I see um, Mr. Mr. Yang. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, I'm from a PV, it's called Tianhe PV Company. The topic for today is how could we achieve win-win through cooperation from the PV industry. I have a story to share with everybody. Five years ago, because the cooperation between China and EU on PV products um, as there are some conflicts and disputes of the export of the PV, uh, these issues caused high attention from high-level leaders with the communication between leaders and uh, enterprises. Uh, the price uh, pledge was achieved. We participated in the negotiation of that problem. We have achieved the resolution of that dispute. Five years have passed. We have seen the changes in the EU market of a PV. You have observed the changes of the PV companies in China. End of August this year, EU announced that it is not going to um, answer to the producers locally and will stop uh, the anti-dumping treatment of Chinese PV products from China. I still remember when these measures were taken, initially Chinese PV producers commented that these measures are double-blade sold. It will cause damages both to China and EU. Five years later, if we review what was commented on, I believe this double-blade caused more damage to the EU side rather than the Chinese side during the past five years. We have witnessed the PV market in China expanded and the ins installed capacity of a PV increased significantly. So some Chinese PV companies went out of China to establish factories, set up factories in EU. That's why EU announced to stop the measures against the so-called dumping of the PV products from China because EU saw um, the measures had negative influence on the installment of uh, installment of a PV and uh, renewable energy. I believe this is the best story to prove what kind of way we should use to discuss the trade disputes, what is the right principle to use. This is a good example. Trade war between China and the EU, or the trade uh, between, between China and the US, or the trade barrier, or to improve the tariff. These practices will not solve the problem. The only way to solve the problem is through communication. I heard experts, I heard uh, leaders, and they all support the communication rather than the tariff raise. Thank you. Peter Reuss, Chairman of uh, Foreign Office in, in Berlin. Um, thank you for this um, wonderful remarks. I was very happy to hear that the conclusion you tear out of the actual um, process is that you want to speed up to open your market and that you will allow more market access and that you will continue to open intellectual property rights. But uh, on the real ground, I don't see this at all. It's not enough to 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 lift the obligation for joint ventures. If you really want to speed up, we should see by now something. I don't see anything of this, and um, I have to say I was quite shocked by by your remarks, Mr. Rowan, uh, that uh, fairness and equality are the is the language of of the week and. Um, and this is not the language um, which reflect your conclusion that you have to speed up the market. The contrary seems to be the case, that you just want to be strong and uh, not be dependent on other powers. So it leaves me with some, some open questions. I'm sorry to say that. Thank you very much. Next is uh, Mr. Zhang Jai Bing. Yeah. Uh, I'm Zhang Jianping uh, from Chinese Academy of International Trade and Economic Cooperation. So I just speak in Chinese, sorry. Uh, 
Actually, China, EU, US, the three big economies are the most important economies in the world. These three economies decide on the further direction of the world. That's why we're sitting here for this discussion. We sincerely wish globalization can be further developed, a multilateral trade system could be further maintained. I would like to say that some friends from US, some friends from EU, they all believe China is no longer a developing country. China is a developed country now. For example, from the perspective of the United States of America, they believe you are taking advantage from WTO. You graduated from WO. You should not be enjoying the treatment of a developing country. When I carried out communication with my uh, American friends, for example, some parliamentarians and assistance to them, I asked them this question. 99% of US friends believe that China is a developed country. I asked them, what is your judgment and criterion? Their answer comes into many folds. For example, you are the second largest economy and you are the biggest commodity exporter. Your infrastructure is more advanced than that in US. Hey, you are a developed country? Yes, you are. But do you know what kind of a criterion the World Bank is using to evaluate a country that is GDP per capita? Secondly, besides GDP per capita, if you are thinking that GDP per capita is not convincing enough to let you believe China is a developing country, you have to look at the structure of the Chinese economy. Many foreign friends just ignored one fact that in China, more than 40% of the GDP is from manufacturing industry. China's servicing industry or service industry only account 51.6%, and agriculture accounts for 8%, almost 8%. This type of economic structure, do you believe China is a developed country? Let's look at the typical developed country, for example, EU, US, and your country. The service industry accounted for 80%. High technology accounted for a very high ratio, and your industry, in particular, your manufacturing industry, accounts for less than 20%. So from this perspective, China's economy structure is a post-industrial country. Of course, this is a developing country. The third, I used Apple as example, uh, uh, as an analogy, because you're... Uh, sorry, um, it's um, iPhone. And every iPhone assembled in China, what percentage of profit comes to the Chinese pocket? Many people say from the U.S. say uh, $50, $20, or $100. These all surprising, shocking guesses. According to the Mofcom's evaluation uh, two years ago, that was a six U.S. dollars. Today, it is eight to nine dollars per iPhone assembled. This is the added value we could get from every iPhone produced in China. As long as China is working for the U.S., how could you say China is a developed country? Possibly there is one day I'm not working for, I, for Apple or I'm not working for these brands. I use our my own technology, my high added value to gain the development momentum. At that moment, you could call me a developed country. I could accept that. But I, the assemble assembly line, Mr. Gortaming, the owner of the assembly line, he said, in the next 10 years, I'm going to set up 10 factories in India. You know, the first... Uh, Apple factory in India is just being built up. That means in two, in, in 10 or 20 years, these assembly lines will leave China completely. But within 10 to 20 years, the, the ratio of manufacturing in GDP will decrease to 70%, uh, 30%. Service industry will account for 70%, nearing the German level. So you could call me a developed country at that time. But my conclusion is, since WTO needs reform, China, US, and Europe need to sit down and discuss. Because raising tariff is a simpleton's choice if these tool 
can be used to solve the problem. And President Obama should have used this tool. Other presidents have used these tools too. Um, if you use this tariff freeze, this won't work. I sincerely hope U.S. and the EU um, have a patience on China's reform and WTO reform. We need to do things step by step and gradually do it. Much. Um, so our, the next speaker on my list is Harald Weigland from the Austrian Finance Ministry. Thank you very much, Guntram, and uh, thank you all very much for that very interesting discussion. Now, uh, Guntram mentioned uh, I am Director General of the Austrian Treasury, and for the sake of completion for our Chinese colleagues, I also add that Austria at the moment has the presidency of the European Union. Now, uh, let me reflect a bit upon how uh, cooperation with China looks from the perspective of the Ministry of Finance. And here I would say there are three issues, two that we already talk about and discuss, and the third one may be a bit unusual. We don't discuss it at the moment, certainly not in Ministries of Finance, but I believe it will have uh, a positive impact in the longer run if our cooperation works out well or less well. Uh, the first one is the opening of the financial sector. And I was very happy that uh, the recent, mention, uh, recent measures were already mentioned. Uh, in fact, the very day they were mentioned, we were having a meeting here in Brussels uh, amongst colleagues where we discussed potential barriers to Chinese investment in, uh, in the European financial sector just because there is no reciprocity. And many colleagues around the table were saying, why should we open up our financial sector to companies where we don't really know uh, what is the political objective, what's the strategic objective behind it? And uh, furthermore, where our own banks, when they want to expand into China, do not have the same opportunities. So reciprocity is a big issue that is discussed in Europe. Um, and I think you should take this as a compliment because it means uh, we see China as a developed nation and that is a compliment. We would never dare to call China a developing country these days. But that also means we hold you to higher standards. Uh, the second one is transparency of official debt. Um, we have a great a forum for creditor coordination, uh, the Paris Club. And there's an increasing sense that, especially in Africa, uh, we are having more and more problems with countries, and Zambia is the latest example, where we don't know how much China is lending to these countries. We don't know how that will work in a potential restructuring. And that is, it's not good for stability and it's not good for trust because the Paris Club is an instrument where everybody needs to trust each other. We are open uh, about uh, uh, our outstanding debt. And when there's a restructuring, we coordinate in a way that is beneficial for all. So uh, it would be hugely helpful if in the future China could uh, uh, decide to join the Paris Club so that we can have that kind of cooperation. The third one is an issue that is not discussed at all at the moment. And I think, first of all, it's, it's very new to European ears. It's only just starting to be reported. And secondly, the, all the things that come out of the United States are just so horrible that people just wouldn't bother discussing China at the moment. But it's the situation of the Uyghurs in China. If we come to a level where we deal with each other, eye to eye, uh, uh, between civilized nations, there will be a backlash in Europe at a certain point because European media, European society just will not take us trading with you if one million people are in internment camps and undergoing re-education. It simply cannot happen. We don't have this backlash at the moment because people focus on other things, but it will have an effect in the longer run. So this would be my take. Thank you, Thank you very much uh, for the very clear words. Um, and my next speaker is Mr. Tsong Liang. I want to 
two aspects, two points, simple, very brief. First is, how could we look at the impact of trade war on the world? According to IMF's forecast, 5% uh, of GDP at the present, the world economy is a big vessel. It goes well because one country takes one special policy and the ship rocks and rolls. There is a huge risk. Not just the parties involved, other parties will be involved. In the whole process, U.S. will suffer too. According to the statistics, the trade deficit expands. American people will pay more to buy products. So from this perspective, we have a very important idea. Trade war seems to be unilateral, but the inf influence is global. For example, if you withdraw from a nuclear deal, and uh, it might be a huge influence on Iran, but actually the biggest influence is on EU. China will be influenced too. This is just an example. Secondly, what shall we do? What shall we do to solve these problems? And the, the risk of a trade war, we need to reinforce cooperation between China and the EU. This is presented in the following aspects. In the next 15 years, China will import 24 trillion US dollars, and the overseas investment will be 2 trillion US dollars. We will accept 2 trillion investments into China, and there will be um, a 2 billion Chinese people or travel out uh, over the next 15 years. We need to use this opportunity to support the WTO reform. In China, we have a saying, without rules, there will be no rectangular or circle. We need to have a rules to do things. If we use the American first principle, for example, the Belgian football team is excellent, is a strong. If to if we are going to produce a rule which says Belgian football team first, other football teams cannot be allowed to compete fairly. So multilateral mechanism is very important. So if we one country uh, says no, so we need to collect or unite other people. So if one system cannot work, we need to start a new system. Secondly, what we're going to do, we're going to deepen our reform and perfect our market system. After the 40 years of opening up and reform, we are trying hard to learn market economy rules. Unfortunately, many people say Chinese economy is not a market economy. Do we do we see any other modes that are more effective than market economy? I believe the road the Chinese economy took is the market economy road. This road is going to be expanded. I think EU should be the first to recognize China's market economy status. So this is a way to oppose multi to, uh, protectionism. Fourthly, the cooperation in terms of financial industry. There is a huge potential between China and the EU. China has been supporting the stability of EU euro exchange rate. We support your settlement system. We support more roles done by euro. China and the EU cooperation in institution uh, cooperation. Uh, some experts say you don't have a clear understanding or a clearer picture of the proposal. That means 51% of the controlling share in a bank or a financial institution. In the next steps, these stock connect or the bond connect will be expanded into Europe. So the state-owned banks are lending to state-owned uh, enterprises in the statistics themselves. Uh, 
the enterprise loaning, the financial institution loaning, or personal loaning. In the bank, I have many customers. If I am loan, if I'm lending to companies, I can classify these companies according to their size. Many companies are foreign companies, for example, Airbus or Volkswagen. So, Chinese financial companies and banking systems are trying to provide a very good financial service to the economy. Thank, thank you very much. Um, the next uh, speaker is Tanya Solubu from Credit Agricole. You have to push the button. Sorry. Sorry. So I'm in charge of uh, emerging countries and uh, geopolitics in Credit Agricole, a French bank. Two questions. If Belt and Road Initiative could turn into a game changer for the relation between EU and China, I wonder a little bit about the strategic emphasis which is now put on Eastern European countries, which are not, sorry for Mr. Sebalos Baron, behind uh, the traditional view of EU from the point of view of uh, democracy and uh, and the trade openness. So it can be something complicated to deal with for EU. And the second point, if it is really a chess game and have some Russian origins, you should take some uh, advice from Russia. We don't speak about this country. Uh, the winner will be the guy who is thinking about the next step. And uh, the chess game seems to me to be a global chess game, which means it includes geopolitics, geoeconomy, security strategy, and so on. And from this point of view, it seems to me that the uh, EU is very weak uh, in the way we speak about this while we have in front of us two big countries. We speak about hegemon, and you're, you're right, weakness and strengthness, uh, who have uh, included the new way to speak a global strategy, which means we will go from trade to Taiwan, to other subjects. So maybe we have to change the, 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 to integrate geo-economy in economy and strategy. Um, the next speaker, I think, is Mr. Zhang Biawei, indeed. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I will just make a few brief comments, perhaps in English, directly. And uh, first concerning China's economic model, uh, it's officially called a socialist market economy. I would describe this as a mixed economy. Actually, it's not perfect. Uh, we are constantly trying to improve it. We call reform, reform, and reform. But on the other hand, you know, uh, the famous slogan of Chairman Deng Xiaoping was seeking truth from facts. You know. China is the only country, arguably, that's not falling into the financial crisis in 2008. I told my American friends, actually when the crisis occurred, the US Financial Secretary came to China. I would say literally begging China for help because they want to issue treasury bonds, including those from IMF, and China have to take the lead to buy, otherwise others don't buy. So in this, the China model has saved, in a way, <laughs> the Western capitalist model, whatever market economy. So in all fairness, I think if you see the, the impact has produced, that China is the only country that can avoid financial crisis. And I told my American friends, from our studies, most probably within three years, there will be another financial crisis. If we really are so <laughs> disagreed with Chinese model, don't come to China for assistance next time when the crisis occurs. Yeah, that's my very direct opinion. Second, concerning China's political system, because quite a few mentioned the uh, Chinese political model. Um, you know, I had a debate with Professor Fukuyama, the author of The End of History, exactly seven years ago. I made two predictions. Now, it turned out to be more or less accurate. One is, I said, because at that time, Arab Spring occurred. I said, Arab Spring will become Arab Winter. Yeah, I made this pre prediction when Egyptian spring occurred. Now it's become a winter. So I think whether the Europeans should reflect on this as well, this kind of enthusiasm to promote the Western-style democracy to non-Western countries. 
And perhaps also it's advice that you could also think or consider a bit the opinion from Chinese experts. We seek truth from facts. I've been to many Arab countries. I think if you elect, have one person, one vote, you are going to elect Islamic government. It's not a value judgment, good or bad, but they do not know how to do modernization. In other words, if the European had listened to our views, perhaps could have avoided this, fight, this refugee crisis. That's my another comment, bold statement. I made another prediction. Bill Fukuyama said you have to conduct political reforms, eventually move to one multi-party system, one person one vote. I said, hold on. I said, China needs political reforms, but United States also needs political reforms. Actually, my concern is not about Chinese political system. There are reforms going on all the time. My concern is about the American political system. So I made another bold <coughs> forecast. I said, without substantial political reform, U.S. may elect president worse off than George W. Bush. Yeah. <laughs> this uh, debate was published in the year 2011 in political uh, uh, perspectives, new political perspectives of the United States magazine. In other words, uh, foreign, if I try to summarize the Chinese political system, in the West it's about election. The Chinese system is about selection plus election. A top leader, one of the top seven members of the political bureau, has to govern at least 100 million people before he came to the top position. So I said, that this Trump, that this Bush, it's way below the Chinese bar. You know, this is my very humble advice to, to look at China objectively and to see the merits. Same with your comment concerning Xinjiang and Uyghurs. I was there just last month. Um, you know, Han Chinese and Uyghur Chinese on the whole have very good relations for so many years. All the Chinese present here can sing Uyghur songs. Uyghur speak their own languages. You look at other ethnic groups in Europe or in the United States, how many of them can speak, still can speak their languages? You know? And uh, um, <coughs> I really doubt your, your data, very much so. Actually, this year, for the first time, Xinjiang has accepted over 50 million tourists. Large increase. So again, I seek truth from facts. You know, most people there feel that it's the best time. You know, that's my humble you know, opinion to share with you. And then, you know, concerning uh, uh, Madame uh, Herrero's comment concerning China should offer more enticement uh, to European partners, which is fine. China should do more and far more. But on the other hand, the European may should also be a bit more proactive. After all, you know, we're not waiting there you know, for, for you to come. It's, uh, I tell you, give you a simple figure. In the first half of this year, China's domestic consumption contributes to 80% of China's growth. It's the world's largest consumer market. The United States will fail in its trading war. If you lose the world's largest market, consumer market, your company will become a second-rate company. And uh, furthermore, this, this uh, consumer market, $6 trillion, is calculated in US dollars. If you calculate it in purchasing power, it's much bigger. Yeah. For instance, this uh, mobile payment, China now is already 50 times of the United States. It's vast, you know, expanding consumer market. It also reminds me of this case of a uh, Sino-European uh, project for cooperation, the Galileo project, the, the GPS system as a project between China and EU as part of strategic cooperation. China was very sincere about this. We tried to do it, make it real. But Europeans were less sincere in the end, we found. But in the end, China, of course, moved on its own way. Now it's a Beidou system, can compete with US GPS system. So it's not, you know, uh, uh, simply uh, one side should try to uh, work hard to entice, the other side should also be more active and proactive. It takes two to tango. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for these wise words. The next speaker on my list is Peter, Peter Chase. You're, oh, you want to? Oh, sorry.
Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, this has been an absolutely wonderful discussion. I'm sorry, I'm, I need to go very quickly. Um, my name is Peter Chase. I'm a senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund. I also happen to be an American, so um, I, 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 although I'm based here. Uh, three very quick things. The first is with respect to the Trump administration. I think it's worth at least putting in a slightly different perspective. I think that tactically and strategically what he's doing is wrong. But I think that it's worthwhile thinking about if you take away all the tweets and you take away all the noise, the question is, what is the actual message? And I think that Mr. Run said something very interesting about you know, how does the strongest country in the world complain about being a victim? I tend to agree with you. <clears throat> so I've tried to unpack what the administration might be saying if you reframe it in a way that makes it more easier to deal with. And the, the point here would be a feeling of the president and many of his advisors and many in the US, in the US that we've been open for a long time and we've made commitments to stay open for a long time. And we did that in order to help <coughs> promote global growth over 70 years. And now there's a feeling that there's a need to rebalance. That is, rather than the call for reciprocity is, well, we've been open, others have not been as open, we need to have more movement from others. I think that that's not an unreasonable message in many, in many ways, and I think it provides an opportunity, both for China and for uh, Europe, that many have discussed here. If the United States is saying there needs to be a rebalancing, a rebalancing in responsibility among partners, that means that there needs to be a rebalancing in authority among partners. And I think that the, United, the discussions with the United States have to be a little bit more about, I think, some of the things that have been mentioned. Okay, if there is a rebalancing, then maybe not everyone, not every head of the World Bank or the IMF has to be a European or, or an American. That's not an unreasonable demand. And it, if there's a rebalancing, whether or not China has surplus savings that it can inject into a system that's in, in, in crisis, that's, these are worthwhile. There are things to do in that respect. The, the second thing, very quickly, is um, I think that it's worth seeking truth from Frax in looking at some of the things that Alicia said. Alicia was essentially talking about businessmen and businessmen choosing to to do business or not with China. Okay, that's, so not a government issue, not a political issue. And here, what businessmen are seeking actually is what they call national treatment. And I think people need to unpack what national treatment means. And what it means is that government measures do not, do not discriminate between companies simply based on the nationality of the passport of the owner of that company. And this goes to China's state-owned enterprises, state-directed. The question is, if in a system there is a, a bias towards providing goods and services, either from the government or from government, uh, measures that government uses that affect the way players operate, that go against non-domestic businesses, then even if it's the largest consumer market, it may not be worthwhile to try to com compete in it. So, and I think that this is, this is not a political issue, it's just looking at what businessmen are looking for, they're looking for, and I think Alicia said this very nice, very properly, national treatment. The final thing is on this question of whether or not China is a developed country, and I think the, the the points that Mr. Zhang made, uh, Zhang Jinping, made about the different provinces having different, different statuses, that's true. It's also true in the United States. It's also true in Europe. Slovakia does not have the same economic structure as, as the UK or Denmark, nor Germany. Germany is much more heavily manufactured oriented than than other parts of than the United Kingdom, for instance. I think on this one, China needs to, needs to do a little bit of seeking truth from facts, needs to look a little bit at its impact on the global economy and that portion of its economy that's engaged with the, the global economy, 
and say honestly to itself, are the disciplines that, accept, that exist in the World Trade Organization, are those dis disciplines disciplines that that part of our economy that is engaged with the global trading system should be able to accept? And my gut instinct is that if you look at it and analyze it carefully, the answer would be yes. And then the question is, how do you deal with differences within your domestic economy? That's part. That's part of a negotiating process. That's part of, you know, the structural funds in the cohesion funds in Europe. Those are done in a way that is that are to help underdeveloped parts of Europe, but in a way that's consistent with the global trade rules. China can do the same thing. But I think that that China I'm sorry, it's not Maybe we're all developing countries, okay? <laughs> that, that's the better line. We're all developing countries. But the question is, is China in a position to accept the sorts of disciplines that any major player in the global economy should? And my gut instinct is that the answer is yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, um, and my next speaker is Stelios Macri Dakis. Sorry, from the European Central Bank. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, being able to participate in this uh, very interesting and topical discussion. Uh, maybe I will make, uh, uh, I will stress two points, maybe bring a bit of a central banking perspective uh, in the discussion, a bit abstract uh, from uh, the political uh, nature of uh, some of the elements of the discussion. So I think the first thing um, uh, I would like to point out is that uh, trade protectionism, as it was effectively mentioned by many people around the table, uh, is not a solution um, uh, to um, uh, uh, sorting uh, issues that should be like trade disputes that uh, should be um, uh, dealt within the multinational, um, multilateral uh, trade uh, framework, um, as it has been the case in the past. Whether that needs to be reformed, certainly uh, might be the case and should be promoted, but clearly trade protectionism is not a solution to the problem. Why is this? Uh, and I think here one needs to understand a bit uh, how uh, trade protections, particularly tariffs, uh, work um, uh, and what are the implications, both in terms of, uh, let's say, the short to medium term, but also in the long term. Um, first of all, in the medium, uh, let's say in the short to medium term, um, uh, tariffs uh, have uh, a bearing both on uh, uh, economic activity as well as inflation. But also, uh, a second key implication is uh, the potential long-term impact, and that is a potential uh, output growth, which I think is, is very important also from a monetary policy perspective. Now, if we focus only on the short term to medium term um, uh, impacts of tariffs, then there we distinguish uh, two channels. The one is the direct uh, impact of tariffs, and it effectively works uh, through the relative prices between uh, domestic and imported goods. Now, the impact on growth um, uh, e and inflation will depend effectively on the degree of substitutability between goods produced uh, domestically uh, and those uh, imported. Now, the indirect effect of tariffs is more on the confidence uh, channel and on the changes to financial conditions. If there is uncertainty about future trade policy, as currently is the case, uh, then of course um, uh, economic agents, be it businesses or uh, consumers, might adopt a wait and see strategy. And that of course will have implications for investment as well as consumption. And then turning now to the long term, as I said, protectionism will effectively um, will dampen um, uh, the drive for innovation, for exchange of um, um, uh, knowledge productivity growth, effectively. Uh, it will dump a productivity growth and enhance potential output of the affected economies. Less competition will lead to less efficient allocation of labor and capital across sectors and firms as some of the um, introductory, uh, uh, introductory statements that were made in this uh, seminar uh, made clear at the beginning. Now, another element that I want to stress, uh, just to close, is basically that protectionism, um, uh, or if you like, the raising of tariffs um, uh, by unilaterally by one country, which is re retaliated by others, um, will effectively harm also the country that 
initiates the process. We have carried out, uh, for illustrative purposes, uh, policy simulations using uh, uh, the ECB models. And uh, we simulated um, uh, uh, a scenario according to which uh, the US raises, let's say, tariffs by 10%, um, uh, both on final and intermediate goods for all trading partners. And those respond um, with equivalent tariffs on the US exports, but not vis-a-vis -vis each other. In such a, a scenario, and abstracting for the assumptions that are actually underlying the scenario, um, uh, effectively, the economy imposing the tariffs, in this case, the US, um, it, it will see real economic activity to um, uh, be reduced by as much as 2.5% um, uh, percent, uh, relative to the baseline, so no tariffs, only the first year. And more importantly, global trade um, uh, will fall by as much as 3.5% in the first year. So I think uh, this is just to underscore the point that uh, the measures are uh, this type of approach uh, is, is not conducive. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, so, so I think we have, um, I have two more in my list, um, Claudia Vernotti, and then I give the floor to uh, Wei uh, uh, Zhang Guo, and, um, and then, um, then we have very little time left, and so so I would propose that, because also uh, Miguel had to leave already, I would propose that um, we give you, uh, Ron, a quick word, uh, Alicia, a quick word, and then to, uh, to André and to Mr. Zhang, yeah, so that we, but really, um, the, uh, and if you accept yes. that you don't speak, because then we have, uh, Miguel doesn't speak, then otherwise it's impossible from the timing point of view okay. Okay. Uh, to, finish, uh, to finish on time. So, so, so Claudia, uh, very quick intervention, then um, uh, the Vice Chairman. Uh, yes, it's working. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I would have indeed many comments because this is a very, uh, has been so far a very, very interesting discussion. But, please, but uh, yes, I will yes. limit to Thank four you. main points. First one is, uh, and I want to be a little bit uh, maybe uh, yeah, challenging here, which trade war? Because, uh, I mean, somebody already mentioned this before, but uh, the, probably the term uh, war is not really uh, a good representation of what's happening because by definition, uh, a nation doesn't trade with uh, their enemies. So I'd rather uh, like the definition of Aaron Poe as peaceful confrontation. So this is the, let's open up. Uh, a second point, uh, and, and here I also share some views of previous panelists, is that uh, so-called trade wars do not have winners. So somebody before mentioned uh, about chess war, but chess war uh, is a lose-win game. And here I really think there is no, there cannot be winners, neither bilaterally, so neither China nor the US, um, and this has been clear so far in certain victims which have already been generated, uh, but also among third parties. Uh, and so this also is, uh, is, is the case for the EU. And uh, before also Bruegel study, I think, mentioned that uh, the impact on per capita GDP of this uh, so-called trade war will be 3 to 4% uh, of the GDP per capita of each of the three uh, blocks. So uh, that's another point. And then I share uh, the views of Alicia and also uh, Vice Chairman Joe in saying that this is beyond trade. It's not just about reducing uh, the trade deficit, but it's about uh, domestic politics. I mean, Trump is clear, needs to ensure voters for the midterm elections, and that means uh, to, to also uh, decrease this deficit. But then also it's about, indeed, the containment of, uh, of the China's rise. Though I do not believe that uh, tariffs are the, are the good way to do so, but actually would uh, create the opposite effect, and that is to create even more urgency for China to advance its goal of the Made in China 2025. And then very last point, uh, and where is the EU in all this? Is in the middle, as Alicia mentioned. Um, on one side, it shares uh, with China the idea to, um, to develop this trade multilateralism, to protect it. But on the other side, uh, there are some shared concerns with uh, also, of course, with, um, with EU, US vis-a-vis -vis China. But I would say here that the objectives are very different because while the EU really seeks more reciprocity and greater access for European companies doing business in China, 
the US Trump, I think, has a very different vision. And here I would just like to read uh, late, latest uh, no, we, uh, tweet. I think we, uh, we have to skip that. Yeah. Uh, if you, uh, okay, just tonight. about yes. Apple. Uh, basically, how he's saying that uh, with a tariff, of course, Apple will be penalized. The solution should be Apple should move the production back to the US. So it's okay. a, the final argument here is really to change completely uh, the supply chain, the, the supply uh, chain out yeah. of China. Thank, so thank you very much. Mr. West. I would like to respond to the comments from our European friends. First of all, the trade war, do we need you as our allies? Our answer is yes, we need you as our allies. Secondly, with you as one of the allies, what problems between China and the EU should be solved? I believe at the present, there are two things we need to solve. Thing number one is the misunderstanding between these two parties. Some lack of knowledge between these two parties. So this seminar is very important. Similar seminars in the future should be held. What are the misunderstandings? First, the EU side believes the reform of SOE is not transparent. The reform of SOE is not to the point yet. Secondly, subsidy. Thirdly, the intellectual property protection. On the other hand, China has misunderstandings on EU. For example, the ECB reform is not clear enough. Secondly, Chinese people believe in the trade war between China and US, EU does not present his ideas clearly on which side EU stands. Thirdly, as a next step, what is the future, uh, what is the next step of EU development for Chinese companies they do not know? For one thing, uh, e they say EU does not recognize China's market economy. And on the other time, EU has some doubts on our manufacturing industry. I believe these misunderstandings are caused by lack of information, lack of knowledge. What are we going to do as a next step? All the comments, all the issues mentioned by our European colleagues are natural issues and we can't understand. But we need to give China some time to the exchange and a seminar like this should be reinforced. CCIE is a high-level think tank. And what, as a next step, we need to do more. Thirdly, what is more important, we need to work hard after this seminar to produce something specific. For example, our reform and uh, opening up. Alicia mentioned what the definition of a state-owned enterprise, what is the level of operation, what is the next objective of this company, the definition of state-owned enterprises. This is a very good beginning of the seminar, and we need a lot to do after the seminar. Th thank you very much. And of course, um, also from my side, I want to extend my thanks for um, this good exchange and um, the importance of um, exchanging information that is absolutely crucial and so I think it's, it's very important for this event to have had the chance to discuss but we still have four speakers so you really have I mean we have ten minutes which means you have one minute one minute and then here we have three and three and then we are done okay so one minute please
Well, thank you very much. Um, one minute, uh, two observations, very briefly. First one is about BRI. The other is about Xinjiang. Um, well, people have a question about BRI. It's a very legitimate concern. The question is not what is the BRI itself. It is what is the motivation for China to propose this BRI. Let me show you this. Uh, there is a saying that is to say what you are, uh, be careful what you are wishing for. It might become true. Because for years, American friends, European friends tell China, you're already a number two economy. You, sh you should not be a free rider anymore. You should shoulder greater responsibility. So that's why China has to make some proposal to demonstrate that China is a responsible stakeholder. We like to do more for the rest of the world. And now this morning discussing about China, whether it's a developing country or a developed country, I take the, the developed country narrative as a compliment. But this is also be careful what you are wishing for. It might become true. China will become a developed country. <laughs> Give us uh, some more time. Very briefly about Xinjiang. Uh, three weeks ago, my institute has co-organized a conference, a big conference in Kashgar University, which is a, a border city quite close to Pakistan. The people out there told me it won't be possible if we do this kind of conference one year ago, even two years ago. But now it's possible. People feel safe out there. So some necessary measures have been taken to curb the terrorists and also extremists to stabilize the Xinjiang is quite necessary. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Alicia? The reflection may be not very positive since we are at the end of our event. So I wonder whether you should have given me the floor. But really, as I hear ourselves, we're supposed to be experts, and we don't agree. We do not agree on how we see things, which is very worrisome because, of course, much more work needs to be done, but we don't have time. We really don't have time. I mean, I hear, uh, and rightly so, I mean, I understand where China is coming from. China needs time to accomplish what China has been thinking China should be as China was. So there's nothing wrong in being what you were. I mean, you have all the right to be what you were. But the problem is the world, and the US in particular, is not ready to, to, to give you that time. And, and, that, and, and thus, I think it's very, very worrisome that we don't agree on, on very basic principles on how we see each other. Because at the end of the day, and I agree fully with Claudia, I mean, not the not the flow. I know that China will, ha will be the largest, as I said, if not already, consumer market in the world. But so far, it's not for us. It's not for us. We have a trade deficit with China, no matter how big your market is. I know bilateral trade deficits don't matter, but, but at the end of the day, for business people, they do matter. And this is why I'm really thinking that we need to really listen to each other with open minds, because we don't have time to you know to keep on thinking that the other is wrong or I really don't think we have time because this is a structural change in the global economy and we need to rush that's the only thing I can say um, so so now we have our thank you our two uh, concluding uh, remarks by um, Bruegel senior fellow Andre Zapir and then uh, uh, Zhang Weiwei thank you uh, I will try to make um, five, uh, five points. Uh, I will certainly not attempt to, to summarize such a, such a rich uh, discussion, and especially not in, uh, in three minutes. But uh, it seems to me, point number one, I think uh, everybody, uh, everybody agreed, uh, and that's the title of the, uh, of, of the seminar. This, is not a, this was not a seminar about China and the EU. This was a seminar about China, the US, and the EU. And I think everybody agreed that indeed, and that was said many times, that the EU, US, and China are the biggest economies in the world, uh, roughly, of the same, uh, roughly of the same size. And so one can say roughly of the same responsibility for the uh, governance, together obviously with uh, other countries in the world uh, for the governance or for the leadership in the governance of the uh, of the system. 
Second point, I think it's fair to say that neither the EU nor the US nor China are similar to the other two. And that's, that's a difficulty. We have been talking a lot about China uh, being different from the US and the EU, and in, to some extent it is, but I think the EU is also different and the US is also different. Let me just pick two points here. I would say, as far as China is concerned, I wouldn't say that China is different. I would say China does not fit into any of the traditional categories. I don't think that China is a developed or a developing country. There's aspect of both. I don't think China is a market or not a market economy. It has aspect of both. And by the way, to make this complicated, there is no definition in the WTO, since we are talking mostly about trade, there's no definition in the WTO about and no test about what is a market economy, not a market economy. And there is no test even about what is a developed and developing country. You cannot find it anywhere. There is the term developing country and developed country in the WTO, but there's no place a definition. It's what the membership agrees upon. If you are a developing country because the rest of the membership agrees you are, you are. If it doesn't, you are not. And that's it. No. How do you make this kind of decision today? It's very, very hard. The EU is also obviously very different. We are not a unitary state. You talked about geopolitics. We do not have an army. We don't have you know, airplane carriers. We don't have those things. We don't have an uh, air force. We don't have that. Right? We are very different. And the US is different because the US was clearly the pillar of the system. So we're in a very, very complicated situation. We need to find a way to deal with us. Now, this, I think, leads to my third point. I think there's no doubt. You spoke about unfairness. Everybody sees unfairness in the system. This is a very bad situation. I would very much agree with Alicia. We are, I think, in, in a difficult situation because it's understandable that China does feel that the system is unfair. We, are, we made a high test for China to enter into the WTO. W, you know, China was upset. It was treated much more harshly than any other country that acceded to the, to the WTO. We are upset because we feel that our expectation has not been met that you would have changed the way we thought, maybe naively, that you would change. And so everybody thinks, you think we are unfair, and we think you are unfair. Everybody is thinking that everybody else is unfair in this. Right? And the US now is behaving in an unfair manner. So I think we need a little bit of calm here and, uh, and rapidity. Fourth point, um, I'm afraid also that you know, I, I think it's great to have bilateral discussion. Uh, but I don't think it's an issue now. Is the EU going to shift in uh, a bit closer to uh, China with the EU? I mean, with the US, I don't think that's the way. That's the way to go. To to have this bilateral discussion, we do need a multilateral framework, and especially between those three economies, the EU and the US and China, they do need, they do need to find a way to rekindle the multilateral system. And I agree with you, Alicia, that uh, we should be in a hurry. Uh, frankly, I'm pessimistic. I'm pessimistic that the EU, the US, and China will have together the wisdom to rapidly take notice of what has happened to the world, and that we cannot apply the old rule, but at the same time to go back to the 19th century and uh, simply have uh, power relationship is also going to be extremely, extremely painful in a world where we are so intertwined. So we do need the uh, wisdom. And I finish, in a sense, with what Herman van Rompuy said in his great wisdom. Uh, I thought it was, I was very impressed when, when he said, well, uh, we are certainly not anymore in a unipolar world. We are not anymore in a bipolar world. We are not even in a multipolar world which is typically what you know, we, uh, we discuss in this geopolitics, right? The difficulty of having a system which is multipolar. He said, we're in an apolar world. No more pole. 
that is able, in a sense, to impose uh, its, uh, its vision. And I think how we navigate in this world, again, I think requires a lot of, uh, a lot of wisdom. So I think let's bring the, the pressure down on all of those fights. And you know, China has a lot of wisdom. Uh, there's no doubt about that. I think Europe has a lot of wisdom as well. And the US also has a lot of wisdom, maybe not today's government, but the history of the US has also been one of wisdom. So let's collect our wisdom together and move forward and bring about, again, a new multilateral uh, system. Thank you. Thank you very much, André. Please. OK, thank you very briefly. Actually, it's difficult to summarize all these uh, uh, thought-provoking uh, presentations and comments. Yet, perhaps, um, as the Chinese saying goes, you know, we have to seek common grounds while reserve differences. And both China and Europe, EU, are committed to multilateralism, committed to open trade, and we all hope for a fair and a just system, although sometimes there are differences in definition. There are differences about whether China is a developing country or a developed country. Uh, what about Chinese political system? What nature of the Chinese model, whatever. Uh, but I think we can continue our uh, discussions uh, in the coming uh, months and years, which is crucial. And I think uh, you know, Mr. Zhou Xiaotuan mentioned a very good point. You know, how to assess the United States? Uh, you may think two scenarios. One is, um, say, uh, it will still embrace multilateralism, but under different rules. The other is simply to abandon multilateralism. So these are the, I think, two profound, profound questions for both sides to consider. And I really counsel our European uh, uh, colleagues here. You know, China is one of the very few countries that have been consistent for decades in support of the EU and European solidarity. We think the stronger the union of the EU, the better for Europeans for global peace. And this is crucial. As a political scientist, from my study of the American strategy, is to undermine. Yeah. And for reasons, I'll give you an example. You know, uh, again, I prefer to offer some counsel, which you may listen or not listen. If you look at the crisis in Ukraine, yeah, it's not in the European interests, to my mind. You know, the fundamental interest in the, to my mind, in the. Mediterranean area. For instance, if you look at the size of the population in Africa, very soon, you know, in 20 years, there will be four times of the EU population. Yeah. You have to promote development there, peace there. So China's grand project, Belt and Road, we can, as uh, uh, Mr. Zhang mentioned, already both sides agreed on cooperation in third countries. This is something we can do, do big, you know. And uh, just an example, uh, just one final word about Belt and Road Initiative. You know, uh, this shows also the, uh, you may say, cultural differences between uh, Chinese mentality and European mentality. Uh, for the Europeans, they prefer you prefer very solid, specific rules, rule of law, and then you follow these rules. You go to an investor country, you know the rules clearly. The Chinese mindset is, um, if we summarize Chinese model, it's uh, experimental, it's gradual, it's accumulative. We don't have a roadmap for uh, Belt and Road Initiative yet, but we have a compass. It's about which direction to move, about mutual links and connections, about infrastructure. And we believe that, say, a decade or more into the future, this roadmap will appear, just as uh, the Chinese economic model, socialist market army, did not appear until 14 years into the reform and opening up since 1978. So if we can grasp these differences between the two sides in terms of culture and philosophy and, and, and way of thinking, then maybe we can better appreciate each other's positions and seize the opportunities. Thank you.
Well, um, I think we are coming to an end, and let me very much thank um, CCIE and the Vice Chairman Wei uh, uh, Zhangguo for bringing such a high-level high delegation of uh, Chinese officials, thinkers, um, experts here to uh, Brussels to discuss with us. I think it has been extremely enriching and fruitful discussion. Um, and again, thank you so much for um, this uh, very good cooperation and this very interesting exchange. Thank you also to the interpreters and thank you to everybody in the room who contributed with comments, remarks, questions. I think this discussion will continue. It's not the end of this discussion, but it's good to have started that discussion here together. Thank you very much, Vice Chairman. <laughs>